Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM, blasting out of the Mojave Desert like a Scirocco, blazing across the land, slamming into your radio like a supercharged nanoparticle of unobtainium. Greetings from the boldest, bawdiest, most outrageous city in the world, the planetary capital of sun, fun, sin, sex, and secrets, my not-so-humble hometown, Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is George Knapp, your occasional host, designated driver of the airwaves, and moderator of tonight's upcoming cacophonous cavalcade of conversation. Someone please send us a gigantic iceberg plucked from the Arctic and send it here to the southwest. We're on fire, literally and figuratively. A toasty 109 today in Las Vegas hit 115 yesterday. That's uh, more than 20 days in a row of 105 or hotter. And yes, I know it's summertime, so it's always hot in the desert. Just seems more than a bit excessive so early in the summer. I have an apple tree in the backyard, went out to check on the fruit yesterday, found the apples were baked on the tree, just fried right there on the limbs. Ditto for the grapes. Uh, even one of our cacti burned up, and when, when cactus starts dying from the heat, you know it's hot. And I'll tell you, it's not just the desert uh, experiencing harsh weather, of course. I uh, heard from Coast listeners tonight Living up in the Pacific Northwest, they say it's way too hot there, unseasonably warm, way too dry, no rain, the snowpack is gone. And, of course, we know we've read about all the major storms, hurric- uh, not hurricanes, but uh, tornadoes ripping up the East Coast and the Southeast. I mean, it seems like the planet is hot and bothered and angry. And in keeping with that theme, we have a hot show for you tonight, which you can listen to in the air-conditioned comfort of your home or car or big rig truck. Tonight we cast a very wide net, trying to scoop up a a bounteous harvest of uh, paranormal mysteries. And the reason we'll cover a lot of ground tonight is that our main guest, documentary filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, has so many irons in the fire, uh, projects he's working on that have introduced him to some of the most interesting, controversial, and charismatic figures in the realm of UFOs and conspiracy topics, One of those is the godfather of conspiracy himself, John Lear. My neighbor here in Las Vegas and someone well-known to the Coast audience. It's been quite a while since we've had John on the program, but he'll be here in this hour in part because he's the focus of a project years in the making, a film called Immaculate Deception, which is the project that got Jeremy Corbell started down this strange, dark, and sometimes twisted path Later, we'll hear from an important new witness in one of the central controversies of ufology, the Bob Lazar story. I'm not going to spend a lot of time retelling that story. You've heard us cover it on the show many times in the past, including earlier this year. Tonight, we'll hear from a scientist, uh, no question about his credentials or experience or clearances, who says that he remembers working with Bob Lazar back in the 1980s. And I think it's going to be tough for skeptics to disregard this, I think. Uh, Then we will delve into the weird world of alleged alien abductions. You'll recall the late Dr. Roger Lear, a favorite guest of ours on this program. Before he died, Dr. Lear took one last object out of the body of a suspected abductee, a man known only by the name Patient 17. He's the subject of another Jeremy Corbell film. Tonight, Patient 17 will join us live on the air First time he's done anything like this, and you can hear his story, his testimony, for yourself. And then, finally tonight, a scientist we'll call the Nano Man, brilliant guy, working on cutting-edge technology of various types, who has discovered something strange, something he cannot explain, a technology that he says is beyond anything made on Earth. We will hear from Nano Man in Hour 4 tonight. It's a full plate, as you can tell, and add to that our NAPS news section, compiled from all over the place by webmaster Tim Benall and me. You can find it on the Coast website, included in tonight's collection. More on that infamous story about Jackie Gleason, Dick Nixon, and the pickled alien. Uh, Also an item about how ancient Greeks worried about the walking dead, and by that I mean zombies. A piece about abductee fears, plus sleep paralysis, and a lot more. 
While you're there on the website, check out how to become a Coast Insider. The cost is pennies a day. Gives you access to a vast archive of previous programs. You can listen at your convenience on a variety of different devices. It's a really good deal. We have so much material to cover tonight, so let's get to it. Crank up the AC, folks. Slip into those silky jammies. Kick back in the Barca Lounger and fasten your seatbelts. Back in a moment with Jeremy Corbell and then John Lear. I'm George Knapp, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. We have a good one tonight, and here we go. Jeremy Corbell has traveled an interesting path on his journey to Coast to Coast. For much of his life, he was a world-class jiu-jitsu teacher and trainer. He had schools and conducted seminars all over the world. He made a transition to contemporary artist, took on some really creative endeavors and projects, made a name for himself, then morphed into an investigative filmmaker with a specific interest in belief systems. And that interest led him to John Lear, to UFOs, the Bob Lazar story, alien abductees, secret labs, nanotech, government spooks, and a lot of the stuff we cover nightly on this program. Jeremy, welcome back to the program. Thanks, George. This is going to be a controversial show for sure. Good deal. That's what we like to hear. Uh, (laughs) Let's jump right into your John Lear project, since John is with us just for this hour. Tell me how that started, what the premise was, and where it stands. Yeah, the great question. Thank you. The, The premise was essentially I was absolutely fascinated by John Lear and the things that he was saying back in the time of the 1980s, the late 80s, 1989, when you guys broke the Bob Lazar story. I mean, John Lear was so outspoken, and just the way he talked, I mean, it really captivated my imagination. You know, so John Lear was kind of like the gateway drug to ufology for me. You know, it was amazing just to hear him talk. So he really is the godfather of conspiracy. I say all roads lead from John Lear, and for me that was the case. You know, the, the moment I engaged John and he allowed me to turn that camera on, which was not an easy task. I mean, John, you know, really kind of kept a distance for a long time, but, but let me finally turn on that camera. And it was like a whole world of conspiracy opened up, you know, to me. So, so John really was the nexus and, and the starting point for all of the investigations that I found myself involved with. I know what uh, you and John have told me is that you you know you're you're not as a filmmaker you're not uh, taking a position on any of this stuff or you're trying not to. I mean you you think he's a credible guy and an interesting guy, but you're not saying everything he says is true or false or e- either way, right? Yeah, I mean John and I kind of you know got we've known each other for a while now. We kind of got at each other about this, and no, I can't you know claim to believe everything John says, but. What has maintained and, and, and kept my fascination is certain things that John has said I have been able to prove. And, you know, starting from how he helped reveal the stealth fighter uh, through, you know, your mentor, Ned Day, um, you know, he was the guy sitting out by Area 51 taking photographs. He has this image of Area 51 and why it's different than even the best image today that's on Wikipedia is, is because he, he took it from ground level. I mean, this is amazing. This is a story I don't know if people know, but John Lear took an image. The only barrier between him and Groom Lake was a chain. Yeah, I've seen that photo. I've used that photo. I've stolen that photo and used it. It's, uh, <laughs> no one will ever get, ever get that again because no one will ever be allowed that close to Area 51. Never. Um, so where the, the, the film is Immaculate Deception, where does it stand? Yeah, so let me clarify that. You know, I honestly, I've been getting, I'll call them love letters, right? I've been getting a lot of letters from people. You know, as an independent filmmaker, what I do is I focus in on a subject. Now, everybody can admit John Lear is not the, the most simple of subjects. You know, there is such a depth and breadth to his story. So I have been filming with John consistently for years now. And this is bigger than a single movie. So those of you holding your breath for Immaculate Deception to come out as a 1.5-hour movie, stop holding your breath. This is something bigger. I think that we're going to, you know, let it out in a series or something like that. Right now, all I know is I have some incredible moments with John Lear over all these years, uh, kind of intimate moments of, of who he really is. And that's what I'm interested in as a filmmaker. So, for you know, for example, I just, put up. People have not even seen this. 
but a trailer for, for the film footage and also a couple of extra bonus clips. So basically, the status of the film work with John is, is time is going to tell. But at this point, I'm just starting to leak out the footage. So you can expect that consistently over time, and we'll see what form it takes. Okay, so where, where do you see that stuff? Where is it? Uh, you can go, like, on my website, my primary website, extraordinarybeliefs.com, is everything for Coast listeners. I mean, just anything we talk about tonight, just go there. That's it. Everything is there. I mean, I posted all this, like, secret stuff for you guys. So just, just take a look. It's, it's a Pandora's box for your mind. Well, let's jump into and bring on the guy we're talking about. John Lear is a retired airline captain, former CIA pilot, son of a famous inventor of the Lear jet, of course. He's a Lockheed L-1011 captain, highly regarded in aviation circles, has flown more than 150 test aircraft, has won every award uh, given by the FAA. He holds 18 world speed records, worked for 28 aircraft corporations, and uh, as we know, during the late 80s and early 90s, he got involved in UFOs and conspiracy stuff, and that's what he's best known for. Let's bring him on. John, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks. Nice to be here, George. You know, part of what's covered in the film, as we've been hearing, it's still under construction, but it's your early interest in UFOs. And I've always, that's the part, that era that really interests me, of course. It's when I first got to know you. Uh, You had done all this stuff that we just mentioned, but now you're known primarily for conspiracy and UFOs. Tell me about the early part of your journey, uh, how you uh, how you got started down that path and how you collected information back then. Well, I was... uh taking some flight instruction down at uh, Hidden Hills, which is a small airport south of Pahrump, uh, and I uh, had been interested in uh, uh, UFOs, uh, or actually in the uh, SR-71, <clears throat> and was collecting material on it, and I had it located um, at the Nevada test site, but I didn't know exactly where. So one day we're talking we're talking about it uh, at this little airport, and somebody mentioned uh, Area 51, and I said, "What's that?" And he said, "Well, that's the uh, that's where they test uh, these airplanes." So I went back and got out this all my maps, and sure enough, there was an Area 51, and right in the middle was uh, Groom Lake. So I started focusing on that, and sure enough, there it was. <clears throat> so in 70, I guess it was the summer of 77, I was then uh, running the uh, uh, airline called Bonanza Airline 2, and I got a couple of my friends, and we, um, I took them uh, out to Groom Lake, and I didn't tell them where we were going, but so we got early early in the morning, we uh, we left Las Vegas, got, got uh, up to Groom Lake about... Uh, uh, six or seven o'clock, and uh, at that time the gate, there was no gate. There was a uh, chain link fence down at the uh, at the um, lake bed itself. So we went down and uh, took a, a lot of pictures, and uh, we uh, saw a little trail of uh, dust coming our way. Actually, two trails, and uh, we figured somebody was coming over to check us out. So. What I did was uh, take another roll of film and put the the first one in the glove compartment and left the other roll of film in in the camera. So when the guys came up, um, they said, "What are you doing here? Are you the news folks?" And we said, "No, we're or, or aren't we supposed to be here?" And he said, "Hell no, you're not supposed to be here." <laughs> and uh, so uh, he called somebody else on his little radio and. Uh, Pretty soon, another guy came out, and uh, they took our driver's license and social security number, and there was a big hassle there for about 30 minutes, and uh, the guy, um, uh, I said, you probably want this film. He said, yeah, I need your film. So I uh, unwound it in that day. It was an icon. Unwound the uh, the film and uh, gave it to him. Uh, of course, didn't tell him about the other film that was in the uh, glove compartment. Uh, and uh, then they gave us a little briefing. They said, we want you to uh, leave here, uh, go back to Vegas. We're going to call you next week, and you'll get a briefing, and then a, and then a uh, another briefing. And so we left. We never did get see or hear from anybody. 
and uh, that was the beginning. And those are the famous pictures uh, that I took of Groom Lake. That's uh, MiG-21 sitting in front of the hangar there. So you were not looking for UFOs at that point. You and Jim Goodall and the interceptors, you guys were became interested in a base that wasn't on the map, that officially didn't exist. You start looking for weird, uh, advanced, secret aircraft, right? Right. And that was what we were looking for. And and you helped break the story of the stealth fighter, made it, uh, you know, slipped it out, made it worldwide news. That's why you had credibility with us, uh, I know, in the beginning. So then you become interested in UFOs. Is that because you heard it from some of your sources? Because, I mean, as I mentioned, you knew people everywhere in the aviation circles, military, intelligence, CIA, all over the place. Yeah, I'd heard... Uh... I'd heard about the UFOs, and uh, the, my friend that uh, was based at Bentwaters Air Force Base told me that he was there during the, the famous Bentwaters incident, and uh, so that got me pretty interested. And uh, then uh, I'm trying to think of uh, what the uh, what the connection was uh, before I met uh, Bob Lazar. But, well, you had I remember you putting out the the Lear hypothesis, which exploded like a bomb in uh, ufology. Who is this crazy guy? Where does he get off saying all this stuff? But you had traveled around collecting information from a variety of well informed sources and kind of put it all together in a manifesto that uh, that that hit uh, hit like a tidal wave. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, and uh, that um, it came out, and then the I think. That introduced me to uh, Benowitz. I never thought uh, I'd get uh, connected with that guy, but uh, he was one of the uh, the guys that uh, initially informed us about Dulcie. And uh, I never thought I'd get uh, as far connected with Dulcie as I did, but uh, there it was. And uh, he knew about it, and he had uh, regressed somebody who had been there. As a matter of fact, just recently I had a 24-page uh, document uh, uh, typed up and uh, written about uh, this uh, this uh, abduction. Uh, Jeremy, tell me this: I, that part, that era where John is becoming the John we know, is I I would think a key part and one of the most interesting parts of the film you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, John is, is polarizing. You know, he's like this cowboy. He's got a total disregard for any version of authority you can come up with in your mind. You know, John was breaking rules and, you know, pushing buttons and shaking the trees, you know, well back in the day. And so, you know, this attitude, you know, ultimately the film Immaculate Deception or the series of films or whatever it becomes, um, it, it's going to be a portrait of John as a pioneer. You know, he's an undaunted explorer. He's investigating things. Um, you know, the, the, the sky and the stars and the UFOs, but also, you know, it's the nature of the human heart, you know, the investigatory spirit. So this is what fascinates me about John Lear. He never stops. His mind is constantly um, looking deeper and behind the veil. So whatever your feeling is on John's ideas, I would say pay attention. He can tell you and teach you how to be curious. John, uh, we had heard, you know, at various times that you were kind of hanging up your UFO spurs, that you had withdrawn from the field. That's enough. I've, uh, I'm, I'm done with it. Uh, and then every once in a while, here you come again. It seems like it's a hard habit to break. Yeah, I uh, keep stumbling onto... Uh, stuff that's supposed to be hidden and and isn't. For instance, uh, the new uh, the new base we got uh, out in the middle of uh, uh, the Nevada test site called Sandia. Uh, it has about um, uh, oh maybe two three thousand people that work out there. And the problem was how do we get people out there? Um, and this all started in 1987 when it opened. And um, how do we get people out there without uh, alerting, uh, you know, without getting, you know, more jets? The, uh, the um, Boeing 737, if they get more of those, they'll, they'll certainly alert somebody. So what they came up with was uh, high-speed uh, uh, subway. And uh, that subway now runs from, uh, <clears throat> from uh, McCarran, uh, McCarran, uh, Based there, special projects under the um, uh, the 
the Strip. one hotel there. What's the one that's shaped like a pyramid? Uh, well, it was Mandalay. Is that the one you were no, thinking of? No, shaped like a pyramid. Yeah. Uh, oh, Luxor. 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 goes from Luxor to uh, uh, the uh, Bellagio and Bellagio to Groom Lake and then Sandia. Now, the interesting thing is in uh, 1970, or in 2004, <clears throat> They were digging a new line uh, for this uh, underground uh, subway, and they hit the main power grid for Bellagio, and the power was out for three days. And it's just amazing how they were able to cover that up because it was such a massive power outage. This cannot happen to a casino uh, because it's so devastating. I, yeah, I know. I, re- I looked into that after you told me about it, and sure enough, there was a power outage that they couldn't explain. We'll pick that story up, then uh, transition into the Bob Lazar uh, part of the tale. Uh, James Gang, Walk Away, takes us into the break. A little future guitar god named Joe Walsh playing on this song. Back with more Coast to Coast in a moment. Dutch rockers Golden Earring with their 1982 hit Twilight Zone, inspired not by the TV show of that name, but by a Robert Ludlum novel. We got our own little Twilight Zone uh, era uh, area that's forming here. We're covering some pretty strange stuff with filmmaker Jeremy Corbell and our special guest John Lear. When we come back, we're going to segue into the Bob Lazar story uh, because there's a lot more coming on that later tonight. Stay with us. Much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. We're talking with filmmaker Jeremy Corbell and uh, John Lear, who is the subject of a film that Jeremy's working on called Immaculate Deception. As mentioned earlier, if you want to take uh, some, uh, get some sneak looks at uh, some of that footage, uh, it's we have links to Jeremy's site, extraordinarybeliefs.com, on the Coast to Coast site. You can take a look. Uh, in the meantime, though, I hope you'll look later and let us uh, get back to our conversation with John. John, as you know, uh, earlier this year, Bob Lazar was sort of lured out of seclusion and made a uh, an appearance at a ufo conference first time he's done it and uh you know it it sort of raised all these uh, issues again of course as you know uh, bob's story and your role in that story put area 51 groom lake s4 on the map of the world but the suspicion is that and you've heard it many times that you are the svengali who cooked this up that bob went along with your grand designs your Machiavellian scheme to mess with our heads. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the way it really happened was um, I had given a lecture at the uh, at the um, uh, Spring Valley Library, and people were so interested. My house was uh, just uh, uh, devolved with... Uh, people wanting to know more and, and this and that and so on. Anyway, I got a call, for, and my wife ended up hiding all my files and changing my phone number and all of that. But uh, what happened was that uh, I got a phone call from a guy named Gene Huff, and he said, uh, John, I'd like to get some of your copies of your tapes and papers. And I said, well, Gene, I'd like to do that, but my wife is uh, temporarily hidden them. And... Uh, <clears throat> I don't have mm-hmm. access to them, and and uh, but if I ever get them back, you know, we'll we'll work out something. He says, "Okay, well, I'm an appraiser, and I'd like to work out a deal where uh, we'll trade. Uh, I'll trade an appraisal of your house uh, for all of your copy of all your stuff." Well, this was great because I was just looking for a, a an appraisal to uh, to get my house uh, reappraised and get some money to to get a second uh, uh, mortgage. Anyway, I make a, a, a um, appointment, and Gene Huff comes over to my house with this guy named Bob Lazar, and um, by, he introduced Bob as a scientist uh, that uh, <clears throat> that uh, used to work at Los Alamos, and Bob handed me uh, a folder that had his um, uh, had his uh, uh, degrees. The one was from MIT and one was from Caltech. I put them behind my desk, and uh, from there they disappeared and never saw them again. Anyway, me and Jim, uh, me and uh, Gene Huff start talking about UFOs, and uh, and uh, Bob was just rolling his eyes. He couldn't believe anybody could be so stupid as to uh, as to believe in that stuff, but. Uh, we tried to, over the next four or five months, tried to get Bob to, uh, to to cut us some slack 
and look at our uh, information, and there was, I think, three major points that uh, Bob um, uh, came up with, and one was um, the um, evolution of the um, the um, uh, stuff called. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Of, was it a bunker buster bomb or? Uh, yeah, yeah, the bunker right. buster bomb. Or what, what, uh, I forget what that was called. Anyway, uh, Bob was to find out the validity of that and uh, several other things. And he thought, well, maybe I'll just try to get a, a job at uh, Groom Lake. And I was over at his house when he called Dr. Teller. I uh, got a hold of him at uh, Livermore. Lawrence. You were there at his house when he made the call? I believe that's true, yeah. I was there. And um, because I remember him saying um, to uh, uh, Dr. His wife? Teller, Okay. Do you uh, do you want to work in uh, California with me, or do you want to work out at um, uh, at uh, Nevada? And Bob said, "I want to work at Area 51." And I thought that was a little um, presumptuous. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, it turns out that uh, Bob got a, a phone call several uh, weeks later, and. Uh, it ended up that uh, he started getting these interviews at uh, EG&G. And I remember the second interview, um, he came. He would come over to my house and tell me what they asked at the interview. And I remember the first one, he said he aced it because he had done such a good job. And the second one, their first question was, um, do you know John Lear and what's your relationship with him? <laughs> Well, that's the that's the part that people have trouble with. I mean, Jeremy, you've you've dealt with that issue. Is that why would they hire Bob Lazar when he knows John Lear and John Lear's raising all kinds of uh, cane about uh, UFO stuff? Yeah, I mean, put me in that category. I came into this completely expecting that these guys had concocted everything and they were working together. I quickly learned that that is in no way the case. And, in fact, reality is stranger than fiction. I mean, it's just amazing how these things went down. And um, the way they've all told the story, I mean, each individual, and, that, and that's what I'm trying to also reflect a little bit in my film, is the difference, I guess, the different angles of vision and how they all kind of come together. It's one thing to hear John say it. It's one thing to hear Bob say it. It's one thing, if you ever can, to hear Gene say it, you know, but... When, when, when all the stories collide and they come together, although slightly different, the, the, the truth comes forward. And these guys did not concoct it. The way they said it is the way it happened. And it's hard to believe because it's extraordinary. Well, I've said the same thing. I've said it to John, too, about how, you know, you hear it all the time from people who just can't buy it. And it doesn't matter whether people buy it or not. But uh, the fact is that if you weren't there and you didn't see it, uh, I can understand that, but the, the people who live through it, you just kind of have to laugh at it. Don't you, John? Don't you laugh at people who who just can't buy it and believe it was all cooked up, not Absolutely. knowing the, the different personalities, you know? That's exactly how it feels. Um, where do you think that stuff is now, if the technology was at S4? you have any thoughts on, on where it might be or what they did with it? Um, the technology? Yeah. You're assuming it's not there anymore? Well, I don't know. Is that your is that your answer? You think they left it there? Uh, I really don't know. Um, there's a new, not a new. It's it's an old base. It was built the same as uh, same time as um, as Croom Lake. It's 44 miles south of Wendover, and that's where they have the uh, black uh, triangles. They fly out of there, and um, there's a a lot of. Uh, um, uh, flights out of there. I have a friend that uh, uh, flew flew there, and uh, he says that they use the uh, technology of um, of the um, uh, hiding stuff that's in plain sight. I'm trying to think of what they call it. Anyway, uh, they hide things that are in plain sight, and uh, that's just the way it, it goes. You had described to me in one interview we did about a, a, a landing strip, I think it's in that same area, that sort of operates like a zipper. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, it's what they do is uh, it has a m- machine that uh, makes it disappear. For instance, if you were trying to see the, um, the um, 
landing strip out at Sandia, which is halfway between um, uh, between uh, Tonopah Test Range and Groom Lake, you wouldn't be able to see it because they have this thing that makes stuff just disappear. Well, it, I'm just guessing about whether they would move it or not, but it seems like because of the stories and the international notoriety for S4 and Area 51, uh, so many people are out there looking, uh, and including congressional investigators, that maybe it would be safer for them to take it somewhere else to uh, surreptitiously move it out of there and, and eliminate traces of any kind of facility at Papoose. Because, I mean, you know, people who have been there, say that they have not seen a facility built into the ground, into the side of the mountains. What, any thoughts on that, either of you? Yeah, I um, uh, I do believe it was built into the side of the mountain, also in the ground. And uh, <clears throat> talking to you a couple of weeks ago, I found a DMI, uh, uh, a, um, what, the way they used to measure uh, ground elevation um, from uh, airplanes, was uh, to take it from fly over and take the measurement. Uh, and about 15 or 20 years ago, somebody gave me one of these uh, floppies, and I turned it on and uh, put it in, and there was S4 with two gigantic uh, openings to the north and south of where we know uh, S4 to be. And it was fascinating to look at this and realize what must have happened. Uh, it was my information that uh, between 1960 or 1974 and 1976, the Groom Lake was closed to everybody. I mean, there wasn't anybody. There was no records of any kind. There was uh, uh, nothing. Uh, no records of any kind, uh, and something happened there that uh, they didn't want anybody to know about, and I believe that was when they started digging the tunnels uh, on that side of the hill. The other side, where Groom Lake was, those were um, dug out mainly in uh, the early 50s, um, and then later uh, they dug a little bit, bit more, but those those go down about uh, 15 to 20 uh, stories down. It's interesting that the uh, uh, when the when you're going down in those elevators, it's the um, uh, the uh, the uh, military that takes you down, and none of the buttons have numbers on them. They just have memorized them, and uh, they press the button to where uh, you you are supposed to go. Hey, uh, we've got a surprise uh, guest, a caller who also was there back in that critical time period who knew Lazar before he became the UFO guy and knows you very well. His name is Jim Goodall. He's an aviation writer who was one of the interceptors. Jim, you there? Uh, yes, George, I'm here. So this, you... is my first, this is my first time calling in. Here you go. Uh, we're glad to have you. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, you, of course, know John really well. You were there in those days. You uh, saw this sort of unfold as well in the beginning. Do you think it was all cooked up by John and Bob? No, I mean, good. I mean, I knew, I've known John for about 40 years, uh, and I think it was 18, uh, 18, early 89, uh, we were out uh, near Tonopah, and an F, we were going out you know, snooping on the government, and an F-117 flew over us near, uh, was it Scotty's Junction? And we I mean, got all thrilled, and we, we uh, ended up going down the back road to Groom Lake and got buzzed by an A, by an A-7. But on that same trip, I was able to photograph uh, a couple of F-117s going into TTR. By the time we got back to Lear's house, it was, uh, you know, all the photo mats. This is before digital, by the way. I'm ancient. Um, before digital, uh, I, I had print film. And at about 9.30, uh, John says, hey, I got a buddy of mine coming over. Uh, his, name's, you know, his name's Bob. So Bob comes somewhere. It's Bob Lazar. A uh, very personable guy. I'm talking about my dilemma. I, have, you know, I, I think I have the, I'm the first civilian to shoot the 117, but I have to wait till tomorrow to get a process. And he said, well, I have a C-41 processor at home. Uh, let's go to my place. He lives on the west end, the west side. So we jump in. Yeah, I think he had a 280Z or something like that. We jumped in his car. We're heading off. And, he, and he, he looked at me and said, you know, I feel bad for Lear. I said, what do you mean? I said, he's one of the most famous aviation families in the world, I mean, with the Wright brothers and, you know, the Martins and, and you know, and Boeings and whatever. And he said, and the son of which, excuse me, believes in UFOs. 
I said, I, I, and this is before, he, I, I know he was interviewing for a job out in the desert, he wouldn't say what, time, but he said, you could, he said, you could, I'm a nuclear physicist. I either have to, you know, prove it by mathematically or put my hands on it. And I said, you can't put a gun to my head and convince me UFOs are real. Now, this is before I went out to work out in the desert. Um, there was there was no collusion between John. I mean, John's a character. I think all those of us that know him know him to be a character. Um, but this is uh, Lazar is who I believe who he says he is. His story has never changed. Uh, I saw a, a, a when I first went to his house when we were processing the F one seventeen film. You know, I saw. Well, I remember it to be a diploma from MIT. I sort of looked at it because well, my best friend's dad went to had a PhD from MIT, and I just it was just a cool looking diploma. Um, that's before he went to work out there. Hey, Jim Goodall, so, thanks for calling in. We we'll appreciate it, and we're going to have you back on where we can uh, hear more about your work just uh, just with you. But thanks for calling in. Appreciate it, John. I w- uh, thanks, uh, John. I want to ask you because uh, we got just a couple of minutes left with you. You've paid a price for this interest in the topic. I mean, this is no joke, right? No, uh, it cost me my job at uh, American Trans Air. Uh, I gave a guy an interview, and whenever I give interviews, uh, you know, I make it specific that that uh, they don't use my name. And uh, this guy ended up working for the uh, Review Journal. He's no longer there, but uh, he did promise me, no, I won't use your name. And uh, the, when the story came out, the first... <laughs> the first uh, sentence was John Lear, captain with American Trans Air. Well, I got a call that day from uh, my boss and uh, told me to come to Indianapolis where our base was. And he says, we can't have people that uh, believe in this stuff flying for us. You're fired. And uh, so they gave me six months or six weeks pay. And uh, I went up to Detroit and... Uh, started into the cargo injury it was uh, a lapse um, of about uh, uh, two months but i got back in i see your name pop up in a variety of conspiracy related stories i mean you keep a hand in a whole bunch of a whole range of topics you're still active and i i hope you will be for a long time yeah and uh, by the way i want to say hello to my daughter allison who's listening Allie and uh, my uh, grandson, uh, Damien, and just on the stuff that uh, we've uncovered here in the past uh, couple of years, uh, going to uh, uh, Reno, we kept seeing these signs saying underground uh, naval test center. Well, we find out that the Navy has been able to navigate under the 15 western states uh, in the United States uh, with their submarines. And uh, one of their stops is uh, Hawthorne, California. They go to uh, pick up uh, new ammunition stuff. The other thing we found, or the one of the other two other things, is um, Newton's law of universal gravitation is wrong. Uh, it's absolutely wrong. And um, uh, there is no... Uh, there is no... Uh, uh, gravity, as stated by Newton on the moon, the moon uh, has actually, well, it has actually uh, 85% that of um, uh, of uh, Earth's gravity. That's why we could have, the Apollo missions never could have uh, gone there. Well, that's a pretty big one. The gravity isn't, isn't how we know it. Let me ask you this, Jeremy, in our last minute or two here. Is John going to be vindicated to a degree in, in, your, in your film or series of films? It's, it seems like you've been shooting long enough. You must have enough for three or four films. Oh, yeah. It, it's going to be a, a series of uh, pieces on John. And, you know, it's like, is John going to be vindicated? What's amazing about John is that, you know, some people think he's a courageous prophet of truth, and other people think he's a charlatan and a kook. John will entertain either. Oh, you know, John, is, is, he tells his truth. He puts it out there. It's up to you to, to look at it and decide and investigate yourself. So is John going to be vindicated? His life is vindication. So much of what he said, I would say there is buoyancy to, you know, his, his ideas about the, uh, you know, subs under the earth. I mean, uh, that's all I'm going to say, but I'll, I'll say that John has told me some things that sound outrageous. And then through the course of time, there has been validation for some of it. So can we be vindicated? I don't know. John, uh, I'm just going to do my best to convey 
the person I see in front of me. And that's what John, Immaculate Deception is about. And, John, a final question. You, I don't know if you think you even need vindication, do you? No. Uh, <laughs> everything's uh, just fine with me. And uh, anything else that you're working on that you want to tell us about? Anything cool coming down the road? Uh, that's about it. The uh, uh, the gravitational um, uh, the gravitational pull of the moon is not one sixth of Earth's, like uh, at NASA has said. It's uh, about sixty five percent, which means the Apollo missions could never have gone uh, with that much uh, uh, gravity. All right. And we'll have a lot more details on that. But what that essentially means is everything that NASA has ever told us uh, about the gravitational pull of the solar system is wrong. All right, John Lear, the one and only. We'll have you back and talk about that in greater detail. Thanks for joining us. It's been great. And Jeremy Corbell will be back in a moment as well. Talk a little bit more about the Lazar story. For all you revolutionaries out there, Jefferson Airplane, volunteers. Bad Company, Burning Sky from 1970. The song is appropriate in more ways than one. Tonight our guest, uh, Jeremy Corbell, is coming to us from Pioneer Town in the high deserts of Southern California. And that area has been in the path of these gigantic wildfires this week, but was spared by the hungry, billowing walls of flame and smoke. Uh, Jeremy is at the Pioneer Town Motel, and he tells me uh, there's a celebration underway at the famed uh, Pappy and Harriet Saloon, where they're all listening to the program tonight. Among the revelers are a few dozen of the firefighters who've been out there in the heat battling that blaze this week. Glad you're all with us. That is a cool little town, and that area, of course, has a great UFO history of its own. Uh, George Van Tassel territory, if you know that name from the early days of ufology and the contactee movement. As I mentioned at the top of the program, uh, our guest Jeremy Corbell has uh, followed some strange paths in his quest to put together these investigative films. He's dug up some new sources of information on the various topics of interest to Coast, and when we come back, we're going to hear all about one of them. Stay with us. A lot more to come on Coast to Coast AM. Back with Jeremy Corbell. Jeremy, uh, t- you know, one of the uh, sort of roles that's kind of been thrust on you, whether you wanted it or not, is uh, a, a defender of the Bob Lazar story. And, and, and I, I, I want you to share with us how, how the Lear story sort of led to that. And, uh, you know, you know I've, I guess we could mention that you've been into sort of a back and forth dispute with Stan Friedman. Stan's not here tonight, so we're not going to go into any detail on that, but you guys have gone back and forth about the Lazar story, and I, I imagine it's weird for you to be in the position where you're you're out there on the edge um, telling Stan Friedman that he's wrong about it. Yeah, look, I'm, you know, it, basically, there's a, Lazar is polarizing. The, the, the story of Lazar is polarizing. Uh, I just think it's wrong to say someone's pro-Lazar or anti-Lazar. I mean, that even messes it up more. Right. Essentially, right. The re- what, what really inspired me to, to look into this is that the, the evidence became weighty. There's just simply, if you look, especially within you know, the, the 25 years of time, over time, the evidence is just more in favor of the uncomfortable possibility that Lazar is telling the truth than it is against it. And you have to look at all of the evidence, not cherry pick it, not stay in the past. And so it's, it's not just one individual. It's the entire logic flow of people who do not look at the evidence for themselves. And I unfortunately peeked behind that curtain, you know? <laughs> so I am thrust in this position. I did not ask for it. And, and look, I'm, I'm not fighting anything. I'm following the truth. You, ufology is not a popularity contest. Ufology is about following the evidence. And that's, that's all I'm doing. You know, we just heard uh, John Lear say that he had seen Bob's degrees, and I've never heard that before. I've never heard anyone who said they had seen Bob's degrees. And I, it's a sort of a central issue with Stan Friedman and others who say that Bob is not telling the truth about where he went to school. And I, and I have dealt with that issue over the years to say this. And it for me, the key uh, issue was whether or not Bob Lazar really did work at Los Alamos National Lab. If he worked there in a scientific or technical position, if he had security clearances, 
then I think that that could justify the idea that he could be hired to work at a place like Area 51. So that was always a central question. And as you know, the the, uh, lab denied that they had any records. This went back and forth for a couple of years. I know he was there. We've interviewed people he worked with before. None of them would come forward. Uh, We found his name in a phone book. We found a newspaper article with him on the front page and a picture of him saying he's a physicist out there. We know he was there. But now you've found something uh, that that bolsters that case in a major way. Tell us about it. Yeah, I mean, before we get to that, I just want to say, I mean, look, George, you have cracked this case wide open for 25 years nonstop. You have been privy to information that most people haven't. You know, off the record is one thing. On the record is another. I can say also for myself, I've been privy to information off the record, but to have somebody come on the record and talk about it, because usually people are worried about losing their contracts, their jobs, or their associations, and and so that's the problem. Now, I can sum it up really simply for everybody that kind of looks at the Lazar case, and I understand, because, you know, essentially, you know, look, Los Alamos and Nellis Air Force Base have not been willing to confirm, you know, Lazar ever worked there at either location, and in such a situation, skepticism is, is not only healthy, but it's required. Um, but, but I no longer have the luxury of disbelief, I, and that's for a number of reasons. But the logic flow goes like this. People say, because they can't verify Lazar's educational claims, then Lazar is not a scientist. Then Lazar did not work in scientific capacity at Los Alamos. And then they say, thus, Lazar is too unlikely a person to have been selected to work at S4. I mean, that's the logic flow. Yep. And it all stems from the original idea that they can't verify Bob's educational claims. Well, well my logic flow is different. I accept I can't verify Bob's educational background. I mean, many great masters have tried. However, <laughs> if I can put him as a physicist at Los Alamos in the 80s, not a janitor like people would like to try to throw out there to dis, you know, disinform people, just you know, basically if he worked there in scientific capacity in the 80s, then this is an essential link um, to why he might have been employed at S4, which you and I both know exists. Right. So who'd you find, and how did you find? All right, well, this was you know, kind of wild. I have these little kind of you know, web searches, these little bots that basically go and pick out keywords and conversations, and I look for anything that involved the cases that I'm looking into. And sure enough, it was actually, I think it was through Facebook, and um, I found this guy uh, named Paul, and, and he just made this off-the-cuff kind of comment in one of these, you know, little open blogs. And, and he says, well, you know, my neighbor, you know, he, he's a scientist, and he's worked at Los Alamos in the 80s, and he just kind of mentioned to me that, you know, he knew Bob Lazar back in that time. And I, I just, this is too good to be true. Are you kidding me, you know? So I, I, I find this guy, we, I befriend him, we start talking. And he actually put me in touch uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with a scientist out there, not a ufologist, uh, not, not, not somebody who's even interested in this field. And the, the poor guy didn't even know why I was being put in touch with him initially. You know, it was just there, there's a filmmaker who wants to talk with you. So through this kind of strange, I mean, I sought him out. You know, other people seek me out. I sought him out. And he didn't know what I wanted to talk with him about. And then I opened up the door and started asking him about his background, where he worked, and uh, what his experiences were, and have you ever met Bob Lazar before? And that's how it all started. Why don't you set up what his credentials are and, ter- and where he worked? Uh, we're not going to play that little piece of the audio. We're going to go to audio clip three and then four. But in, in earlier clips, number two, uh, that you made available to us, he describes his depth of experience. So can you summarize some of that? Yeah, no problem. So the, the man's name is Dr. Robert Krangle, and he works out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, he's an engineering physicist is how he describes his work. Um, that's practically what he does. Um, as far as his credentials and everything, um, he was able to supply me with numerous, uh, you know, IDs from his work at China Lake, Kirtland Air Force Base, Los Alamos, Sandia, Manzano Weapon Storage, um, even Homeland Security information from New Mexico Tech. Uh, 
Energetics Materials Research and Testing Center. I mean, he, he, he validated to me this is the real deal. The guy's a scientist. He's worked in these capacities. I've seen contracts the best I can. I know the man is talk, is, who is, you know, he is who he says he is. Um, he, he talked about 1973, graduating from MIT in semiconductor physics. I actually found an article in 2002 in the New Mexico Business Weekly that gives all of his credentials. He's a public person, although he's, you know, he is personally private. Um, you know, it wasn't that elusive. I was able to find the guy. I went down to his laboratory. It was like Frankenstein's workshop. It was amazing. So this guy is the real deal. He's worked in all these places, and I can put him and place him um, in the early 80s, actually, working out uh, at all of those bases in those areas. So, so that's you how know, it started. Right. And he, he just sort of like a troubleshooter, a contractor who comes in, gives a fresh a pair of eyes to a problem that maybe one of the national labs uh, has trouble solving, and, and that's what he does. So that's why he's worked at so many places. We're going to uh, – here's a clip. Uh, t- this is clip number three we're going to play, and uh, you were able to record this interview with him. Uh, that is recorded with his knowledge, right? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. I never record right. anybody without their knowledge. Yeah. All right, let's 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 go ahead and listen to this. This is uh, Dr. Robert Krangel. What is it that you have done at Los Alamos? What time frames and, and or whatever you can tell me about that? I, I've done contracts up at Los Alamos pretty much all through the eighties. Uh, I still do contracts with Los Alamos, uh, not as many as used to, uh, but I still you know have some contact up there. Uh, but all through the eighties, that's I was doing you know design project this or you know the uh, a kind of an ancillary engineering. You know, their engineers have been beating a problem, and sometimes you get too close to the problem, you know, where you, you, you can't see the forest for the trees. So they bring in people like me as, as an outside contract to take a fresh look, you know, see, what, see what's going on. Though the equipment that I may have been working with might have been on some high security, something or another, but an amplifier is an amplifier, a signal generator is a signal generator. What you do with that equipment, that may be classified, but the specific piece of equipment itself is not classified. All right, that's a key point. He, he, you know, where somebody like him could come in, you don't have to have ultra secret, majestic twelve clearance to work on a piece of uh, some classified project, a piece of an airplane or some other kind of platform, right? Right, and that was kind of his point was that you know he has been in and out working at all these places, and and he, you're right, you know he is like one of these problem solvers. He's kind of a left field guy, you know, kind of reminds me of someone else we know, yeah, uh, but. You know, what, what he does is he goes in as a subcontractor, which, by the way, most people that work out at Los Alamos and that kind of thing are subcontractors. This is a normal thing. This is how people get work done. So, yeah, th- you know, he qualified to me that he's been out there a whole bunch, and he was out there in the 80s, and, you know, he's a straight shooter. And he was there when Bob Lazar was there, and you asked him about that, his first interaction with Bob. Let's play clip number four. One of the reasons why I was introduced to you was because you're not into this world that I'm investigating that includes ufology, advanced propulsion systems. But one thing that, that I was told was that not only did you have some work that you did at Los Alamos, but additionally that you somehow met Bob Lazar. What was your first interaction with Lazar, and where was it? Well, it wasn't much of an interaction. It was, you know, one of these things, you know, meetings and, you know, like security meetings, you know, you have to go to go to that once every week or a couple of weeks, you know, and they give you the, the usual briefing about don't talk about what you're doing, don't talk about what you see. So Lazar, we didn't work together, but, you know, cafeteria kind of thing, you know, you pass them uh, in, in some of the, the, the commander's call, if you will, you know, meetings, you, you, you pass them. So, yeah, I, he, he was up. And about what year was it that you remember seeing him? <sighs> to pin it down, certainly in the 80s, uh, probably earlier than late 80s. What's interesting to me is you're saying that you would run across Lazar at like a security meeting, you know, don't talk about this, don't talk about that, or in the cafeteria. Was it your impression that he was a concession stand salesman or a janitor, or did you think he? <laughs> uh, he was dressed wrong to be the janitor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so how did you know Bob? In what capacity was he there working? From your knowledge, uh, you know what what was he there? What was he at Los Alamos? Well, he was a physicist, which I'm a physicist. 
uh, we we kind of recognize each other. You know, it's the classic, you know, pocket condom with the all the proper different colored pens. So that's, <laughs> he he fit that mold. If if nobody would have told me he's a physicist, uh, one look, he's a physicist. You know, he he he's properly dressed in geekdom. Did people tell you he's a physicist, or was that ever explained to you? In in some conversations, you know, that somebody would be talking about what somebody was doing, uh, and they put over, oh yeah, that's you know that that oh that and that's him over there. So uh, that's his opinion about it. But you asked him further. There was another clip. We're not going to play that one. But uh, in this, in clip five, you say you asked him, "Do you have a direct memory of him being in the security briefings at Los Alamos and, and Bob Lazar being there?" And he said, "Yeah, I remember seeing him there." So, which is sort of also proof that he was more than a janitor. Let's play number six. You ask him about whether he is certain that Bob was a physicist, and then we'll get a comment. What was your impression of what Bob was doing at Los Alamos in the 80s? Well, at the time I was I was there, I really didn't know what specifically Bob was doing. We didn't work together. Mm -hmm. We simply crossed paths, at least, you know, in, in, in glancing view. Uh, I didn't know what he was up to any more than he knew what I was up to. But you did know that he was a physicist. Yes. And that was very clear to you, that he was a physicist at Los Alamos and not, again, like the janitor. Right. And in, in conversations with some of my colleagues, you know, again, sitting over lunch, you know, we'd be talking about something, something happening or who's doing something. It's OK to talk among yourselves. You're just not allowed to tell your wife or your kids what you're doing. But and somebody, you know, oh, yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, Bob over there is, is working on something, something project. Mm -hmm. And so did you get any other impressions? I mean, you've described kind of him very well. He's got kind of got the Hawking's face. He's, he stands out. He's got the pocket protector. He's a physicist working at Los Alamos. Is there anything else that stood out about Bob? Um, just yeah, one of the fellows was telling me about him building a jet car. Ah, uh, yes, the, the famous jet car guy. And it was in the <laughs> newspaper, and it was a front-page article, a photo of Bob with his, uh, I think it was a Honda, modified with a jet engine on it. And, of course, that made him a little bit of a star there at Los Alamos. I mean, that's that's the impression that I've had uh, from other people we talked about who were unwilling to go on the record with their actual names. But is that the impression you got from Dr. Krangle? Absolutely. He actually equated Bob to, like, Mick Jagger. I mean, Bob had made an impression on people. He was like a rock star. I mean, the guy's got, like, you know, a jet car, and he makes fireworks. And, you know, but what I found so profound was... You know, I just went over to this guy's place, his laboratory, had a casual conversation. I said, look, I'm going to be recording this. Is that cool? Okay, great. You know, was, you know did you know that he was a physicist at Los Alamos? Yes. And I, I was like, and it was clear to you that he wasn't a janitor. He was a physicist. Right. Yes. I mean, he clear as day. And this is over 30 years ago, right? So this is like, th this is amazing that he remembers him so clearly. He remembers, you know, he had this impression of him. So, yeah, he was a rock star out there, and we've got somebody who was there legitimately working who remembers seeing Bob Lazar, the physicist at Los Alamos. I mean, how much more do you need? Well, the point being, this guy also, he did not uh, peddle this story. He wasn't out there telling this, trying to get attention. You sought him out after you heard a little tiny tidbit on a Facebook page that you sort of accidentally or, or on purpose found, but that was not an obvious way to find it. I mean, you no. sought him out. I, what I can understand is why he's willing to say it. Yeah, well, you know, I, I asked him about that. You know, we talked the other day when he was uh, sending me, you know, some of the, the proof of who he is and what he did and, you know, his, his you know legitimate access to places. And, you know, basically he said, look, uh, he, he's just one of these renegades. He, you know, he doesn't make his entire living off of these contracts at Los Alamos, although he just had a current one. It, it's just, you know, he just doesn't have fear about it. I mean, maybe it's far enough away that, that it doesn't matter, but now we have somebody in the 80s who was there in security briefings with Lazar, and, you know, he knew details about his life. You know, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, I was just wondering if Dr. Krangle isn't worried about repercussions himself. We're gonna we'll hear a little clip about that on the other side of the break. But uh, you know, I mean, he's seen what has happened to Lazar, uh, you know, yeah. and uh, the the beating he has taken over the years. Now here's Dr. Krangle, who still works for these outfits, who has contracts with them. I mean, obviously he had to think this through before he gave you the okay to to use this stuff. 
Yeah, you know, I think people need to stop fearing a lot. And basically, he's telling you know the the story as as, as he experienced. It. And you know, what's the big deal? I mean, he all he's saying is that he saw him. To us, it, it's a big deal. But to his contracts, I mean, there's not many people in uh, Albuquerque or in New Mexico that can do what he can do. First of all, he's a calibrations expert, so he's he's not afraid because there is no competition in his field. And also, you know, it's such a small portion of his livelihood um, comes directly from Los Alamos now. But you know, they should hire him more. He, he's he's a good guy. He's pretty sharp. I, and did you get the sense that he had followed the story at all? I mean, he's not a UFO guy. He's not reading UFO magazines or UFO periodicals. He's he's doing his own thing. But had he did he either catch up with the story after you asked him about Lazar, or did he know a little bit about it? This was what was so shocking. Actually, was that. He didn't know the, 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 the broad strokes of the story as we know it. He knew the broad strokes from other scientific colleagues, friends of his that were scientists that knew Lazar in a scientific capacity as well. There's this funny story, if you listen to the whole like hour-long interview that I have, that will be available for free to everybody. Um, you know, dissect it, get your knives out, right? But basically he tells this story that he knew Bob Lazar had United Nuclear, and that he was kind of like the guy that could handle these types of materials. And there was, they call it a pig. It's like a buried uh, calibration thing, I guess, oh. for n- nuclear stuff. All right. And, uh, well, we might he- we're going to hear one more clip from him on the other side uh, after the break. Uh, my guest, Jeremy Corbell, will expand on a little bit. Jethro Tull from 1971 takes us into the break on Coast to Coast AM. A classic, you've got to hide your love away, the Beatles. John Lennon wrote that uh, song during what he called his, quote, Dylan period, inspired, of course, by Bob Dylan. The song was released 50 years ago this August, so still sounds really good. We're talking with Jeremy Corbell, investigative filmmaker, documentarian, about uh, this witness, Dr. Krangle, that he uh, dug up and got him to talk about uh, Bob Lazar being at Los Alamos. A lot of people still have trouble with the story, of course, and uh, when we come back, we'll hear one more clip about the consequences for stepping forward and talking about stuff like this. Uh, Bob Lazar certainly paid a price, and we might have a special guest calling in as well. So a lot more to come in this hour and beyond on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. Jeremy, I guess our mention of the uh, saloon there in Pioneer Town went over pretty well in the town itself. Oh, yeah, you can hear the the cheers through the mountains here, man. Pioneer Town's amazing. Um, I should also mention that if people want to hear the entirety of this uh, this interview with Dr. Krangle, you posted uh, these clips on your website, the same link that we had mentioned before, and which is posted on Coast to Coast. I guess the interesting, the most interesting stuff is the what we're going to hear now, which is uh, him talking about the consequences of revealing this kind of information. I mean, you know, I, I, it sounded like from you know reading the transcript that uh, that it's something that he's really pondered in detail. Yes. Is that yeah? That's the impression. Well, we'll play the clip and then you can talk about it. It's number seven. We can uh, play number seven. It's so fascinating to me to talk to somebody who's not you know drank the Kool Aid, knows the whole story, and is really into it, and just says, "I worked there. I saw Bob. He stood out to you somehow." And I understand how Los Alamos would would blackball him. He committed professional suicide. In what way? Uh, by doing that uh, that video that he did, where he was talking about you know the the craft that he he'd had exposure to. Uh, he would. He went into quite a little tutorial on how an antimatter antimatter engine might work, uh, that, which is how they would get enough power and energy in that craft to do what they wanted to do. And he broke the code. He broke from the fold. He talked about it. That's it. That's a death sentence. And why is it a death sentence? Within that security community, uh, that that's just that mentality that's up there of. of don't talk about what you do. By Bob publicly talking about his experience with the work that he did, not at Los Alamos, but south of Groom Lake, he was committing a sort of... Professional suicide. Professional suicide. Because you get blacklisted for doing that. That's right. Jeremy, did you get the impression uh, from Dr. Krangle that maybe he had worked on some exotic technology himself what is he watching his p's and q's kind of you know um if you listen to the entire interview which which as you said is available uh you will hear a little tone in his voice you know he is not willing to break from the fold so if he's seen something or been involved with something 
He's not willing to do that. He saw what happened to Bob, and that is something that he is not willing to do at this time. So, I, you know, we'll have to leave that for another time and see, but, but essentially um, I found that fascinating, too. You know, he knew about Bob through other colleagues, not through the Internet, not through UFO conferences, but through scientific colleagues. People talk. People that work together talk. And that's how he knew about Lazar. And he compared him to Edward Snowden, a comparison that uh, others have made, too. Yes, yes. He sure did. He sure did. That he was, a, a like Snowden, a whistleblower who, you know, uh, whose life was changed forever. Yeah, you know, he, he made that really clear that, you know, he at one point kind of, and you can hear it, he, he took me, you know, and said, look, you know, it, it, it's like Snowden. You know, he, he came forward with this information. He broke from the fold. And, and what do you do after that? I mean, um, yeah, open United Nuclear, apparently. Uh, you and I both gave Bob Lazar a heads up that this was coming, that uh, that this guy was going to step forward and say some things about knowing him back there. We let Bob know and his colleague and friend Gene Huff know and uh, Gene's on the phone. I wanted to get his reaction to what we just heard. Hey, Gene. Hi, George. Hi, Jeremy. How you doing? Hey, Gene. Uh, so uh, give me your take on the, the, the audio clips that we've been hearing in this hour. Uh, you know, I think it's very interesting. And uh, what's great is he, he knew Bob long before the S4 matter came up. He just knew, knew him from Los Alamos, although many of us, you know, didn't have doubts about Bob being there. It's great to have additional support. Jeremy, I think what would be interesting is these people that knew of and saw Bob Lazar at Los Alamos in the early to mid-'80s, I would love to know what they thought when this national story surfaced and Bob exposed that he had been in the back engineering program of the Flying Discs and how all these other scientists reacted to hearing that after they having previously worked with the guy. Yeah, I only have one piece of personal experience about that, uh, Gene, and it was actually an individual who worked out at White Sands for a number of years, and I have validated all of his credentials, and it was a private conversation, so it wasn't on the record. You're going to have to take my word for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. But he was very clear to me, and he says, when I was at White Sands in 1989, we knew what was going out um, on out there, or we thought we knew. There were rumors of what was going on out there, and they said, or he said, we believe Bob. And I said, what do you mean, we believe Bob? And he said, the general consensus at White Sand, from those in the know, the scientists at the top level, they didn't really doubt his story, that they found him credible. And, and that was a shocker to me, because he, even Bob says, there's only 22 people in his program. But um, it has been my experience talking to people who absolutely were in a position, you know, for example, at White Sands in personal conversations the general consensus was that the scientific community in those small circles um, didn't find what he was saying to be too outrageous. Gene, as soon as uh, anybody mentions the, the name of Bob Lazar, of course, you get uh, people come forward to say, oh, I, I believe him, I've always believed him. And you got some people who aren't going to listen to anything. They don't want to hear uh, any parts of the uh, any of the information we've dug up that verify his story. They never get beyond it. They think he's a liar. I mean, you deal with that all the time, and you know that Bob used to deal with it and now doesn't really even want to address it. Right. And, you know, I, you know, I can't walk a mile in those people's shoes and see how things look from them. So when it comes to, a, you know, missing educational credentials, and by the way, to reflect back from John's interview before, I've never seen Bob's diplomas ever, right. nor did I ever hear that, that John or anybody else saw them. But um, anyway, I, you know, I just try and say, well, you know, there's enough evidence that if you just presume Bob Lazar never went to school, he never even went to elementary school, there's enough evidence to show that he worked at Los Alamos and that he worked at, out, you know, at, out at Groom Lake, south of Groom Lake there. Right. Like, but, even if he was homeschooled, that doesn't right. take away the fact that he was out there at Los Alamos. Gene, I actually have a question for you. What? Um, what was the moment for you when it turned from, oh, this guy's, full of BS, maybe, to holy cow. I mean, you're his best friend. What, what was the moment for you that really sealed the deal? Well, I never thought he was full of BS because, uh, you know, when he worked there, remember, this was all, <laughs> we found out about it after the, the fact. When he worked out there, I didn't know what he was doing. I mean, I knew he was, you know, flying through the outer area. That's what he would call it. He was flying the outer area 
on call and would go in the evening at you know different days of the week but he didn't tell me what he was was doing and when you know when everything finally came to a head and he was in danger of losing his security clearance because of his wife was having an affair and they heard that the people who were listening on his phone line heard that they knew about that before bob did it, when it all came to a head then finally he told you know me and jim taliani and i and john lear and um and <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty you know cut and dried i mean his his soon to be ex wife was there and uh, he just said they've got him and i said who's got what and and he just spilled the beans and said they've got the discs out there and told me the story and um i mean what what could i say i mean it's not like he would make this up and and another thing people don't know about bob is that he would be the last person in the world <laughs> to make up a story for one thing he couldn't remember his number you know he couldn't make up a lie and stick to it that is one ta- he's a very talented guy that's one talent that he doesn't have nor does he care what anyone thinks enough to go through the trouble to try and fool them so so if you do know bob you you would know how crazy it is to think that he made up a story for for some i don't know what the payoff was supposed to be <laughs> you know it never but, benefited him or his life very much but gee, way, you know I that also go ahead. reflect back on what what john said when he said that the first um info that bob gathered from los alamos you know prior to s4 just you know digging around to find yes the one thing was the bunker buster bomb was called project excalibur and uh another thing he found was something about a yy-2 facility which was a double faraday shielded you know to keep electronic communications or, or signals from going in or out under a cliff down at los alamos and and also he found out that they were working and machining with a substance that was called LA-1000, which Bob did not know then, but later he found out the LA-1000 was the 115 that uh, powered the flying discs, and they were doing the machining of that down in Los Alamos. Wow. Uh, so, you know, we've been down this road before. It is Bob doesn't go to any trouble to convince anyone that he's telling the truth. He doesn't care. It drives people crazy. Uh, but it's really tough to convey what it was like if you weren't there. I mean, you could tell the story, but if you weren't there and seeing what it was like day by day and all the weird stuff that happened, I can see why people may not w- would have trouble buying it. Yeah, I saw John interviewed not long ago, and, and I can relate. He said that, you know, he doesn't need to read about the Bob Lazar story because he lived it, and, you know, they were some of the most exciting times of his life which is how I remember it. Life was very exciting back then. I don't know if the fact that people might be following you or that your phone is tapped or whatever causes you to feel that excitement, but ufology was magnificent back in the late 80s and early 90s. And while there's still interesting things going on, for some reason, uh, you know, beyond Bob's story, I really don't feel that magic nowadays. So I don't I don't know. It was just my frame of mind or, or the newness of all of it. Oh, by the way, um, the, when I originally found out about John Lear was not at the um, uh, uh, the speech that John gave over at the Spring Valley Library. Actually, George, I had seen John Lear on your old on-the-record talk show, and right. that was the first time I uh, I ever saw him and how I knew Lear existed was on your, your television show. And what was your take on him, did you think? Who's this crazy guy talking about UFOs? Well, he was on there saying that Richard Nixon knew about it, and he was buddies with Jackie Gleason, and Jackie Gleason had a house... I think in Florida, if I remember correctly, shaped like a flying saucer. And I, I mean, you know, I was living here in Las Vegas at that time. I, know, I had never heard any of this stuff. And then when I did that appraisal, by the way, did Lear get a deal on that appraisal? I didn't know where he lived when I cut that deal. I thought I was just going to do appraisal on a house. He had a 2.2 acre estate overlooking the Las Vegas Valley with a giant house and a guest house and a studio and a U shaped around a pool and a tennis court and. <laughs> So that wasn't an hour-long appraisal or yeah, something. It was a long, long, hard job appraisal. So I don't know who got the better deal out of that. But I got all kinds of videotapes and papers, and and really got a really quick schooling on ufology. And I was just I was awestruck that all this was going on beneath my notice. Jeremy, I'll ask you. Let's say if it. Oh, go ahead. You were asking a question. Go ahead. You know, I was just gonna you know just say, hey, Gene. You know, both of you guys have lived it as you're talking about. You know, coming in from, you know, being a, a younger generation and coming in and looking at this, I have to tell you, the first thing that crossed my mind was that you guys were making it up. I mean, Gene, you were criminal number one. I thought you, Lazar, and Lear were thick as thieves, 
and just making this up. And if, I, if my word means anything here, I can testify that after all these years of knowing you guys, that, that the most astounding fact is that you're not. They, 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 you, I don't even think you could coordinate amongst each other to do that. And um, I just I think that that's something that, that we overlook. But I think that the general person looking at the story will have that doubt. And if, if my word means anything, I can tell you as, a, as an investigator, I can guarantee you these guys are not making this up. There's too yeah. much evidence, and I've seen it firsthand. And anyway. not that John and I <clears throat> are enemies. We're not. We're, <laughs> we're friends. But we live in – I just called him yesterday, yesterday to see how his health was doing. And uh, uh, John and I do not function as friends uh, more as acquaintances, Bob was the central cog in that. Bob, John and I never, uh, I don't think unless maybe you, Jeremy, or George was there, I don't. I never see John Lair unless it's a social occasion that you guys are involved and I get invited to it. it and it's not that not, we're alienated from each other. It's just one of those things. I've known George for since he did the story. You know, and I, George, George and I have gone five years and, <laughs> you know, emailing each other, going, "Yeah, let's get together." And, and we live six miles apart, and I won't see him for five years at a time. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, J- Lear and I certainly never conspired to as much as make a phone call to each other. And and there's also, uh, and I'm not saying John's jealous of me, but a lot of people, because I was there, and and I'm the guy they know that backs up Bob's story and says what was going on back then. They wish they were there, and for some reason they blame me for <laughs> the fact that they weren't. I just happened to be a guy that was there. And, and uh, in fact, Bob and I weren't that close of friends back then. We had just become friends, and, and now we've become close friends since then. But when this was going on, I mean, you know, he didn't even know me well enough. I wouldn't have been one of, one of his trusted circle. That would have been Jim Taliani and Joe Vaninetti and people that had known him down at uh, Fairchild Electronics down in California and at Los Alamos in New Mexico. Uh, I was just kind of a newfound friend, and um, and, it, and it evolved from there. But De Bob wouldn't have trusted me with a thing. When, but know, it, be, then, it becomes know. a bonding experience, doesn't it, when you're followed around, there's break-ins at your houses, your phones are being tapped. I mean, that puts you together. Oh, yeah, 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 that shared experience, just uh, not to the degree of soldiers in a foxhole, but, you know, uh, soldiers at war together, even criminals doing bank robberies together, sometimes that shared experience creates a, 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 a deep tie amongst people, and, uh, and that's certainly how it was with this. Even though you've got the, the substantiation that Bob was at Los Alamos on multiple levels, including this new interview with Dr. Krangle, uh, you know, there's some people that are just not ever going to get over the idea that Bob can't prove he went to MIT. If if it could be demonstrated that he exaggerated his educational credentials, can the story stand? Jeremy, first you, then Gene. Oh, yeah. It, it's in, in, he could have been homeschooled, and if he lied about it, I mean, it, it wouldn't make a difference. I, I put him at Los Alamos in the 80s. I've talked to people off the record uh, within the scientific community that, that have proved much more than that to me. But on the record, we have him in Los Alamos. So that's great. You know, maybe people should start considering the seemingly outlandish and impossible, you know, thing that Lazar might be telling you the truth. I mean, <laughs> isn't it time we start considering that? Gene, same thing. You've grappled with that issue for a long time well, yourself. Here's the thing. What if he did come up with diplomas and educational credentials? Does that mean they just swallow the rest of the story? I mean, who would do that? I, I know Stanton Friedman. I had read something he had written lately and said he recalled he and I having a telephone conversation. I recalled it being a, an actual dinner meeting, which I think you were at, George. And Stanton Friedman asked me, uh, He asked. I asked him what it would take for him to you know, believe Bob's story. And he said, well, you know, we could certainly start out with uh, uh, with his diplomas, you know, and uh, thesis from when he went to college. And, and Stan Friedman acted like that was the end of the conversation. But I came back and said, now, Stan, you and I both know just because he proved he went to school wouldn't mean us have one piece of contributory evidence that he worked on flying saucers out in Central Nevada. So the real question is, the people who just dismiss the story because they can't uh, uh, verify his educational t- credentials. Uh, I don't know that it would move them forward at all if he did have them. I mean, this story is so big, if you'll completely dismiss it because you can't see his diplomas, I don't know if seeing his diplomas would uh, 
you know, move the story forward in the minds of those types of people. Yeah, if you're stuck on that point, then I think you really don't want to believe it. You've decided that you're not going to not going to believe it. Look, people have a lot of things to overcome: their religion, their philosophy, their, the entire history. I mean, that's where Bob and I completely differed. Is uh, you know, he was interested in the hardware and the science and technology, which I thought was crazy. I mean, I wanted to know. If, if there's life here from another star system that's older than ours, I want to know what they know about the basic questions of man. Uh, where do we come from? Who are we? Uh, life after death, God, all those things. Oh, uh, What type of transportation they took to, to get here means nothing to me compared to maybe any, any enlightenment they could give us on those other subjects. And Bob was the other way. He's not sweating, you know, he's not sweating life after death and, you know, uh, any, any, the soul, and any of those subjects, he was just interested in the transportation. Uh, Jeremy, anything else uh, based on what Gene just said? We're going to go to a break in about a minute. Yeah, I just think it's amazing, you know, how polarizing. I mean, the the amount of hate mail that I got because I, I got thrown into that awkward position, which I was not the best, you know, uh, person to be in that position. And just the amount of, I'll call them love letters that I got. I mean, it's just, it's just so polarizing. And why is it polarizing? Because of what Gene just said, we need to overcome so many things to look at this with a sober, rational mind. And that's what people are trying to do when they look at this story. They have to get over everything from religion to disbelief. You know, again, I'll say it. I believe Bob. I uh, just want to say Stan was Stan Friedman's not here to be part of this. We do respect him and all he's done for ufology over the years. I mean, he's a titan in the field, and and uh, we respectfully uh, disagree on this particular subject. But he's uh, he's contributed quite a bit. Gene Huff, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks, George. Bye. All right, and uh, we'll be back with Jeremy Corbell, shifting gears to talk about Patient Seventeen in just a moment on Coast to Coast. Billy Squire, 1981 hit, Lonely is the Night. And it is lonely at times, but not when you're tapped into coast to coast. We're all in this together, folks. But it is spooky at times, and it's about to get spookier. I mentioned at the beginning of the program the name of Dr. Roger Lear, the late Dr. Roger Lear, one of our favorite guests, a medical man, a podiatrist who became interested in the stories told by alleged alien abductees. And Dr. Lear lent some of his expertise to investigating further. He performed surgeries on people who were reporting anomalous, extraordinary experiences, People who said that they had unknown objects is stuck into their body, and he would take them out and try to figure out what they were, do some investigation. And toward the end of his career, toward the end of his life, he invited Jeremy Corbell uh, to uh, record uh, forever for posterity uh, one of these operations that he took place. And it was the, the focus of the operation was someone we've come to know as Patient 17. In a moment, Jeremy Corbell will share with us the story of how that project began, where it's led, and then we will meet Patient 17. Stay with us. Much more to come. All right. Welcome back. Jeremy Corbell, why don't you tell us the story, how you came to be working with uh, Dr. Roger Lear? Yeah, Dr. Roger Lear asked me to film his surgery. He wanted me to make a film on him. And the liaison or the person that set it up is my business partner in the Citizen Hearing, Reuben Langdon, you know, as I always say, the unsung hero of the Citizen Hearing. He's really the, the machine there. And, um, you know, he got me in contact with Dr. Lear because, you know, he knew about my films and Dr. Lear got to see some of my clips and some of what I did. And we hit it off and he was adamant. He says, look, I've been following this path for decades. There is something to this. You know, I, I, I like your film work. I, I want you to make a movie on me. And, you know, I was so hesitant. I honestly, my, this was not the part of ufology that I wanted to look into. And he just kind of won me over. And I said, okay, look, Roger, if this is BS, if, if there's nothing to it or you're hoaxing something, I'm going to out you. And he says, I'm not. I'm doing this. This means a lot to me. Please, will you document it? And that's really what happened. And that's how it went down. So I was invited to the final surgery. Um, I, you know, was able to document it, but then it just got bizarre. You know, we lost Dr. Lear and, and it, it was like everybody was kind of, uh, you know, blind at that point. It, where do you go? What do you do? And, and particularly uh, the patient, patient 17. I mean, I like the guy immediately. Um, he's a really intelligent, uh, you know, hardworking individual and we just hit it off. I really liked him. 
and to see how he was left without answers. It was just astounding. I mean, I didn't know what to do besides pursue the story. So this poor individual, I mean, patient 17, had no idea that this was, you know, the lenses were just going to be more focused on him because uh, Dr. Lear was gone. But he's been a great sport about it, being that he's a private person. He's, he's really let me in. I think more than anything, it's our friendship. Um, but, yeah, he had no idea this was going to happen. You know, he, did, he was really a private person. We'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. Did, did you know going into this that uh, part of what you would be documenting is the analysis of material that might be taken out of patient 17? Yeah, I mean, I knew that they did analysis on it, and so I was able, when Dr. Lear was alive, to go to the first, you know, SEM or scanning electron microscopy of the actual object. And, you know, patient 17 was there, and there's this really uncanny moment in in my film that, you know, I, I ask him, you know, would this shake the foundations of your faith if you found out that this was non-terrestrial? And he thought about it because he's a Christian. And he says, yeah, it would. And uh, that was a really powerful moment. And, and so, yeah, I knew I was going to be documenting a little bit of the analysis, but kind of Dr. Lear was just, you know, saying how not every lab does everything. I mean, even patient 17 was frustrated through this process when Dr. Lear was alive. Um, and then, of course, when Dr. Lear passed away, there was no movement. Everybody was jumping to conclusions and saying whatever they wanted, but there was no movement. And that drove me crazy because I just want to know. So I was able to, uh, you know, get the object sent to a lab and paid for and got broad spectrum elemental analysis and isotopic analysis of two different elements. Um, and that you will see in the film, George. So you, you uh, talked about it briefly the last time you were here. Is there anything you can expand on? Is there anything anomalous, unusual about uh, the, the, the analysis, or would you rather not get into that? Well, no. I mean, everything about this whole experience is anomalous. I mean, I have been up and down and through the rabbit hole and briar patch with this, and so is patient 17. I mean, this has been a roller coaster. You go to one scientist, and they're like, this is absolutely 100% anomalous. This has... 35 different alloys in it, and this is absolutely constructed, and it is absolutely unusual. And there, there's even toxicity, you know, within the piece. And if it was leaching into his body, I talked to a nanotoxicologist over a beer in Los Angeles and showed him. He was sitting next to me, and I showed him, you know, the, the, the elements. And, and he, he says, yeah, from a toxicology standpoint, this should not be. This should not be in his body. And, um, you know, if it was leaching at all, it wouldn't be good for him. So it's good he got it out because it was a foreign body. So th there are anomalous things. The isotopes was a huge deal. You know, it was a steep learning curve for me. And oddly enough, I'm going to say this. I've never said this before. You know how people say Bob Lazar is not a scientist? Out of everybody that I emailed these results to to get their idea, Bob Lazar was the one guy that gave me more insights into the isotopes and elements than any other person. So he <laughs> acted as the greatest scientist here. I had never told him, but I actually showed it to him. But I'll say it here. And his guidance was, was amazing. You know, he's a total skeptic on this stuff, but he's willing to entertain my, you know, my film questions, you know? And you were skeptical, too. I mean, is that why you really didn't see yourself getting involved in this? You thought, well, alien abductions is a little too far out there for me? Yes, yes, I, I was skeptical too, and I still am skeptical about a number of things. There, there are things I can prove and things I can't, but yes, it was exactly that, George. I mean, it was like, I, I don't doubt that, you know, we are being visited. You know, I, I get that. By, by what? I don't know. But, but this idea that they would be chipping or tagging people, I mean, that just to me was just left field. But after hearing the experiences of patient 17 and seeing the effects of the experience, I mean, it is terrifying. Um, I mean, he's, he's a big guy, you know, 6'9", and, you know, he, you know, he's a tough, rugged individual. And, you know, brains and brawn, you know, but, but, but to see him kind of terrified by these experiences, and, you know, he was lured into this whole process, basically, of getting this cut out of his body. You know, he, he, it didn't automatically be something that, that was in his mind to do. But, but when it happened, I, I have to say, he went deeper into these experiences. He doesn't want to remember some of them. And, and that's what I found so interesting. So I got sucked in to this story from the human perspective. And ultimately, E.T. or not, 
and you're watching the film, whatever this is, you'll be as frustrated as me at times. Um, E.T. or not, this is quite an extraordinary experience for an ordinary individual. It's a very human story, uh, at yeah. least from our side of it. Well, let's bring him on. I, I'd like you to introduce him, Jeremy. Sure. Well, I would like to introduce you to my, my good friend. We're calling Patient 17, uh, you know, and uh, I just got to say, you know, sorry, man, that this has gone so far. You never expected to, to have me, you know, pushing that camera in your face all this time. But I really appreciate you letting me in and helping to tell your story because I think it's really important that people hear um, what you've experienced uh, through this process. So, hello, patient 17. Hey, guys. <laughs> you're, you're really right on that. It just supposed to have been one, one documentary and over, and here it is, number three and on coast to coast. So uh, would I do it again? Maybe. I mean, it's been interesting meeting everybody in this field and uh, uh, learning more than I thought I did. And um, it's been a pleasure working with you, Jeremy. <clears throat> That's probably the only reason why I'm doing this is I got to know you as a friend and your, your talents. And uh, I would say um, you being groomed by the right guy out in Vegas. <clears throat> Maybe take his spot when he retires. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, you know, I, I, I think you guys are great. <laughs> I think what's really compelling to me about your story is that you had big questions. And this is what I was trying as a filmmaker, you know, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But I was trying to help you get answers, answers to basic questions. And, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Like, you know, kind of what were some of the questions that you had going into this? You know, what, what was it like meeting Dr. Lear, did, did you like him? Was it frustrating? Um, tell me a little bit. Well, when it, when it started, it was with the pain in my knee and an x-ray and finding this thing and then not thinking about it for five years and then just by fluke ran into another producer that did UFO flick. Then he in, in introduced me to Dr. Lear, did all the testing, x-rays. And I really, <clears throat> I just mentioned a few experiences I had in Las Vegas, knowing people maybe at Area 51 or worked there in stories after living there for practically 20 years. And um, things started falling into place. And really, the only thing that really got me interested is when the, uh, they were testing the object when it was still on my leg and it was putting out some kind of uh, signal or energy more than the camera they were using. That's got me interested. But being yeah, a, yeah. living as an abductee and living the UFO story was not even what I ever thought. So let me ask you, had you had a life... You had a lifetime of experiences, anomalous experiences, the classic sort of alien abduction scenario? Well, I actually started maybe the abductions as a child up to maybe teenager years, and then it stopped. And then um, when I, back in, I'd say the mid-90s, I had a couple experiences of maybe seeing these, uh, you want to call them typical grays in my, my bedroom, or the sensation of being, using the word beamed up, but you know, you're being levitated right out of your bed, straight up into wherever, and that's when you kind of blacked out. And I think I don't remember anything after that. But uh, it just seemed, uh, you know, you start thinking back on experiences you had, which you kind of blown off. Because when I was growing up, you didn't really hear about EP until the little guy at the glowing finger eating M&Ms. You know, you just think lost in space and those kind of te television shows. And all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of, you know, this whole world of <clears throat> you guys and the guy from UFO Hunters and Ancient, you know, all the different shows that are on the cable TV. And you start, and this is really worldwide and really happening. Then you start relating, well, I knew a guy at Test Center that supposedly murdered because he had a working comp um, case, and they wouldn't pay him, so he was going to expose them, and that's another story. You find out. Uh, two daughters and uh, their mother had a missing time experience and they came to, they're sitting differently in the car. Uh, so right. these are and I think people I, I know, sure. and it's like, this is really kidding. There's more people involved than you would think in this whole. And, and I, I think that was kind of your, your point. You know, when, when we first started talking, 
was, you know, you had these experiences, but you kind of felt isolated about it. I mean, you know, like you wouldn't really tell your neighbor or tell people because you said people just kind of laugh at it or they don't want to know or they stick their fingers in their ears and they just don't want you to say what, you, what you're saying unless it affects them or someone, you know, that they love. But you said to me that when it actually well, I, happened... Well, I really didn't, didn't live the story. I mean, you know... I'm in my 50s now. What happened to me when I was six years old or a teenager, I mean, a lot of life experiences gone by. But uh, uh, what started this all off was um, the pain in my leg and, and getting the x-rays and finding this object in my leg. And then from there, they said it lay dormant for a couple of years, so I met this other producer, and then it just opened wide up. I mean, everybody, you know, after you're done the testing and the questionnaires, it's like you start – thinking, this is for real. I mean, all indicators say this is it. But it is frustrating because <clears throat> the testing didn't go further than it did. Dr. Lear passed away. And then, you know, trying to get custody of my uh, implant <clears throat> or object, and you can't get to it to finally put this to rest. Is it or isn't it? You have a guy, you know, I think it's Mr. Nano. It's like, you know, it's absolutely, 36 elements, soft metal, doesn't exist on the planet unless you, you know, make it for specific use. Then the other people are like, impossible. So, you know, you, you kind of walk down the middle. I mean, I, I still doubt what it is. I mean, you and I don't really know what it is, right? I mean, you kind of do, right. but you can't say it is 100%. What, what was the feeling? You'd be lying. <laughs> you were describing to me the other night, what was the, the feeling that you had when it was, you know, removed from you, if you don't mind, just short. Yeah, I knew you were going to bring that up. You're right. It was when they yanked it out of me and showed it to me like, you know, somebody delivering a baby, here's your kid. It was like, that is one. It looks like it. It looks like others I've seen. And it was an eerie feeling. But now the testing's gone on. I've seen underneath, a, you know, the conic microscope and all that. down at seal labs. It doesn't look like anything we understand. That's for sure. I mean, you can't look at it and say there's the transistors, there's, there's the knob. It's just an object, and we have no idea if it is how it works. I mean, it's could you could you address the exotic uh, metal? I mean, <laughs> could you address the, the reason idea? Why I went about... along with Jeremy is because he's he put the story together so well. I mean, other stories I've watched or I was involved in were kind of Friday Magazine, where Jerry is a storyteller and he tells. What happened? I was impressed. I said, I'll go along with it. And uh, like Jeremy says, you know, a year later, we're, we're here on the radio talking about it. Could you talk about the anonymity aspect of it? We're calling you patient 17. You Obviously, you have some concerns about people associating you with this topic, maybe in your personal oh. life or professional life. Absolutely. And look what happened to John Lear. He was off. And look at the pilots that flew the 747 uh, from Paris to wine at, over Alaska that was harassing. They went right to a desk job. Uh, people just, a lot of people believe in it, but they don't want to talk about it and they don't want the publicity. So, yeah, uh, honestly, now that's all going on. I like Jeremy to buzz out my face and I can step out of this and call him a night because it's. Um, we all watch the news, we see the Looney Tunes, and um, I just don't want to be in the public eye anymore. I mean, it's interesting, unless somebody writes me a check for $100,000 for a screenplay, hmm. I'm done. <laughs> I mean, it, this is, we're not talking you know, about, uh, we're not talking about recurring dreams or uh, sleep paralysis or hallucinations here, though, right? No, those days are long gone. Um, I don't even think they're, I actually believe there was. Um, something in my room as a child for years, afraid to go to sleep. Back then it was just the boogeyman or whatever it may have been, but now this has all tr come together with the, um, the implant theory. Um, you know, who knows back in the 60s what these things were. I knew what I saw back in 95, but... Um, what? The, the images were different when I was younger than today, or it was in the 90s. Chinese was your stereotype, big eyed skull, skinny body. You couldn't tell if they were in a suit or not. Uh, type of alien. I mean, I, I got up, put my feet along the bed, and it's like, oh my God, I'm going to have to, you know, knock some heads together. I mean, it's that frightening. I knew that's my only way out of the house, and they were in my way. And, uh, but they, they just disappeared. I mean, so who knows what we're dealing with here? I mean, 
You talk about the video from Mexico with the drug enforcement people and they saw the objects with uh, infrared. I mean, who knows what's in our sky that we're not seeing or what's right on the other side of the curtain. I mean, it, it, you start going, like you said, down the rabbit hole and there's this multiple options where we're living. I mean, to think that we crawled out of the ocean and, you know, you know, <laughs> that whole story. And then you go back to, um, believing in the King, King James Version, <clears throat> all the doctors I know say our bodies are created, are created. It's just not by chance. So who was the creator? So you go down that road also. So I, I kind of put my life in. We've been created hopefully by a, a good spirit rather than there's all these gnarly aliens going around and hybrid programs and um, <clears throat> that whole story. I mean, it, it's, it's tough to think about. I mean, obviously, over the years from ET to what's on the television now, are they just kind of warming us up to the idea that this is true? I mean, that they started you off in little steps, and then is Hollywood connected to the whole story? And you throw in the, if the government's already talking to them. Uh, look what the government's doing to our country now. So obviously, they can't be good guys. Because. <laughs> I'll tell you what, fellas, hold on here a second. The Everly Brothers are telling us we got to go to a break. We're talking with filmmaker Jeremy Corbell and Patient 17. We'll continue the conversation after this on Coast to Coast AM. From 1969, the Allman Brothers and Whippin' Post, that might be their best song. And they've got a lot of good songs. Greg Allman wrote that song on the cover of an ironing board. At least that's the story. We've got a heck of a story going here. Patient 17, who is sharing with us a lifetime of anomalous experiences, as told to filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. We pick up the conversation right after this on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. We're talking with Jeremy Corbell and Patient 17, the subject of a film he's been working on. Uh, Patient 17, let me ask you this. Um, you know, in all your lifetime of encounters with these beings, have you ever picked up any clues or have they told you what it is that they want, why they're here? I never talked to them. I barely remember seeing them as a kid and a couple times as an adult. So I have no idea why they're here or, or anything like that. And it's just a complete wash. Had so, you gone to other doctors before you went to Dr. Lear? No, just uh, my MD, because I thought I may need a knee replacement. I mean, the pain that was coming out of this one knee was um, like somebody was smashing it with a sledgehammer. And the funny thing is, once it was discovered with x-rays, the pain went away. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But it was just a fluke. We found it. And just a fluke. I was talking to somebody about UFOs and common interests and the thing with my leg. And he introduced me to Lear, and it ran like wildfire after that. I mean... Uh, people in the UFO uh, world, I found out, are really um, excited about anything new because obviously a lot of it's just the same old stuff from YouTube. Right. I mean, you didn't want to be a part of this, and and that was the thing. I mean, it took like you know, we and we kind of went on this journey together. You know, when Doctor Lear passed away, Patient Seventeen and I kind of looked at each other with saucer eyes, like, what's going to happen now? And and what I find so interesting is that, okay, we all know John Mack, you know, you know Har- Harvard Psychiatry. I mean, he looked into this, and, you know, he said this phenomenon is real. And what I find so fascinating is the way that Patient 17 uh, describes these beings. I mean, he called them, I mean, in my film, he, you know, he talks about this, you know, alien gangsters, that, that, that they're sinister. He believes what's going on is sinister. W- would you tell us a little bit about that? It's just a personal opinion, really. Not much uh, more to say. I mean, they're coming into your home. They're doing what they want with people, abductions. I mean, I mean, how can that be a good positive thing? So if this whole story is true, I mean, there's some heavy-duty stuff going on in our our world. I mean, not to count out everything else that's going on in, in the world when you turn on the news. I mean, it's just amazing. I'm still not convinced, to tell you the truth. I mean, there's just not enough energy. The only thing I really feel that's newsworthy is the um, video Dr. Lear shot in Turkey uh, of at, at night of that one craft where you can almost see something in the windows. I mean, I was in his office when he was talking about filming that. And so, 
there's somebody I personally know that shot that. So unless somebody can debunk that, I mean... Right, and that's also what's interesting <laughs> is that you were kind of on a learning curve about all this ufology as well. I mean, it's like oh, you go to this vertical. doctor, you're in his office, and then he starts talking to you about you know his history with all this. And I remember very distinctly, and this is actually something that we caught in the film, is that... Dr. Lear says to you, well, we got one out. And you said, what does that mean that I could have more? I could be tagged in other places? And he says, yes. And he goes, you know, do you want to learn more about this? Do you want to go through like a regression or try to, you know, try to uncover past memories? And I remember this. I mean, it gave me goosebumps. You turn to him and he says, no. You said, you know, th- this is enough. I-, I don't want to remember. And well, like I said, um, People get excited over this topic. I mean, it's a lot more people are excited about it than, you know, even 20 years ago. And because maybe we're getting closer to disclosure. But, um, yeah, I just don't, I have other things going on in my life and it's nothing I can control. And I don't live being an abductee. Really, it was out of sight, out of mind. I didn't think about my leg having issues until I met, um, somebody else in the film department. And once my doctor said, it's just a piece of metal from God knows where, from childhood, and it's lodged in the place in your leg where it's never going to bother you, just leave it alone. And so I was just going to leave it alone. I had the x-rays and put them in the uh, sock drawer and called it a day until I uh, showed these x-rays to somebody else and their eyes just like lit up and it was just steamroller uh, all the way to where we're at today. I mean, honestly, I would never do this again. I mean, it's just, it's not just not worth it. I mean, it's, it was approved. I mean, right. you, you uh, said videos of life. spaceships with aliens and nobody believes it. So unless you have a Mars attack type situation or something off the wall like that, Independence Day, nobody's, the general public's not going to go for this. I mean, just people are open-minded. Right. You've said, I mean, you said, sorry to jump in, but it, it's just, I'm, I'm, you know, your story is so powerful to me. I mean, you said to me that, like, you know, that, that you don't live your life you know, focusing on the the UFO experiences and all of this, and it's kind of like dredged up this this world that's been happening to you or happened to you mainly as a child and then into adulthood that you didn't really want to acknowledge or or even remember. I mean, you told me at one point they must have, you know, spared you some of the memories because you remember parts of it and then it's gone. Well, I never even thought about my childhood stuff until I got involved with all of you. I mean, then it's like, well, how about back then? And then how about that? Maybe this is all falling into place. So really, I, I never, I went through life never thinking about my childhood and the spooky things. And I remember, the, you know, the terror and whatnot. But it's, it's, um, it's on the bottom of my list of things I need to worry about or even continue to worry about. I mean, well, I mean it, must spill, it must spill over into your personal life, whether you try to put it out of your head or not, doesn't it? Well, I'm sure it has. <laughs> I mean, uh, cool. My nicknames are uh, Cody, as in Cody Koyak Bear, and Eeyore. So, you know, I'm dealing with some type of issues. But I actually live just a normal life where I like sports and dirt biking and music and things. And I'm not, I'm not like the typical up the, up the, uh, who wants to be on television. And it's his moment of fame. And I want to go to the convention and sit at the booth and sell plastic ETs. I mean, it's just. I'm not going to go down that road. I mean, the only reason why I even you know, met Jeremy is because, like, minutes before my surgery, Dr. Lear's like, well, this is Jeremy. He's doing a special on me, and he's going to be part of the crew. And really, even at that moment, it's like, uh, that wasn't part of the deal. So, right, and I, then I remember as well away. how people flooded the waiting room. And, you know, you see that also in um, the film Patient 17 is that you, you, like, escaped through the back door. I mean, it was amazing how the, the waiting well, room got flooded. I felt bad for you. Well, I liked that's why Jeremy got brownie points that day because he actually looked after me in a way and shooed everybody back and got the cameras back in the purses. And, uh, and nobody, he ran crowd control, and I, I appreciated that. And he actually had my back, I believe, some the start of this and that's why i've gone through with this um I the fact that after surgery was over if, if jeremy wasn't around it would have been a done deal over with because uh, uh jeremy's uh piece is uh, definitely getting a lot of play 
and um, I'm amazed, to tell you the truth, totally amazed. Well, the fact that you're here says that you trust the guy, but you don't trust everyone in the UFO field. I mean, I've seen pieces of that, uh, uh, what was going on around you, a lot of hoopla, and I know there's you've been treated shabbily by some some folks. Uh, we're not going to get into to naming them or calling them out, but, I mean, I, I would not be surprised if you just walked away from it, washed your hands, and never looked back. You know, I've, I've got a lot out of the experience, and unless we can get the, the original piece back, and, and and see really what it is or do more tests on it, and it's pretty much a done deal unless uh, Jeremy wants to do something else, another project down the road. I'd be more than happy. But right now this is kind of uh, leading up to, I think he's having an opening somewhere, a showing, and uh, I just hope the best for him because he's just a really a talented filmmaker and, and a great guy. I call him my samurai because he always has some words of wisdom to give me. And... Um, no, well, hopefully we can stay friends for a long time and do some dirt biking and call it a day. <laughs> uh, Jer- Jeremy, let's talk about the object. So the piece was taken out of his leg. Some of it was analyzed. Is there some left? And if so, where is it? Yeah, this is a really um, difficult topic. And it's difficult because, uh, you know, essentially we, Patient 17 and I have, have had a real difficulty getting to analyze the piece further. And that's no surprise. I mean, you'll see in the film some of the problems we run into. You'll feel our frustration. And uh, right now, after, you know, look, you know, Dr. Lear passes away, and then there's a struggle. There's a struggle for ownership, I hear, of the piece. Um, so it really makes it hard for us to get our, our hands on it and do the scientific analysis and do it further, which we'd love to do. But, but, but ultimately, we had some great tests done. And the tests came back anomalous. But again, it, it, there's two parts. There, there, there's the actual uh, analysis, the scientific analysis, and then there's the interpretation of that analysis. And that can vary widely depending upon the individual. I mean, I went to the head meteorite specialist at UCLA to find out the, you know, elemental composition of like a mountain or a meteorite, you know, and it's like everybody just has a different opinion on it. So right now the pieces are kind of in unknown hands because uh, it was Steve Colburn who, who, who had them, but I hear there's a little battle for, for who owns them, and it's, it's, it's sad. And, and I don't know, I really think patient 17 should have his sample back so we can find out a little bit more. But that's the frustrating Well, I'm, I'm just afraid, you know, if Steve loses them and somehow a technicality other people can, they're going to end up on eBay for God knows why. And they're always going to be out of circulation in somebody's collection. I mean, and they need to stay public and, and stay in the system so maybe someday when we have better tests we can find out what's going on. But right. I think it's, they're just going to go to eBay one of these days, and it's just pathetic. I mean, that needs to be stopped. I just found out about that recently. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I want my piece back. I don't want mine going to some guy's collection, and they're gone forever. Uh, you don't know for sure uh, what it is uh, because you know, there's still additional tests you'd like to do, but uh, could, Jeremy, could you address the idea about whether this could still be an accidental sliver of metal that somehow got into his leg? Right. So, So, you know, look this is a really difficult thing to answer because I've gotten so many different opinions, but, but essentially it is machined, it is fabricated, it is highly advanced, it's 35 or 36 different alloys, um, again, some of which are toxic alloys in small degrees. I, I talked with a nanotoxologist that basically you know, looked at the whole analysis and, and told me, yeah, it was really good that uh, patient 17 got it out of his leg because from a toxicology standpoint, you don't want this in you. Now, you know, from a, from a nanotechnology perspective, it, you know, it, I was told by a number of nanotechnologists this was a machined metal, and it has some rare earth elements in it. Uh, the, the big thing for me was the, the isotopic analysis. We have, for sure, an anomaly in the zinc. It, there, and I'm going to make all this public for people to scrutinize. I mean, that's part of the thing. Let's put these documents out and let people scrutinize them. But even further, when I went to like the head uh, zinc isotopic analysis guy for extraterrestrial materials, there's actually one of them, and he's like a doctor in middle America. It's amazing. I found the guy through a scientific paper of his online. I mean, I did some real digging. And he said, yes, your test shows something anomalous. But 
depending on how the test was done, you can have anomalies. So he says you really need to get multiple tests and cross-compare them. And, and he's right. That's the scientific method. So you'll see in the film where it takes us, but um, I can say that it is not a nail, you know? Hey, uh, patient 17, let me ask you this. You know, a lot of the abductee, contactee reports that we've gotten over the decades, the, the people involved will say something positive, like the visitors, the aliens, uh, delivered a little editorial, like take care of the planet or cut down on nuclear weapons or be kind to one another, uh, messages like that. Uh, you think that's a diversion? Did you, did you get anything positive? And do you think there's any positive angle to this? Well, <laughs> I'm over here kind of laughing because it sounds like a beauty patch and everybody wants world peace and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I know. So maybe, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, if they really meant to, you know, they've been around since the pyramid days, uh, you'd think something would have happened by now. It just seems like the planet's just spinning out of control. So if anything was here to be positive, um, I would hope it hurries up, they hurry up and, and, and uh, say hello because... Uh, Obviously, we all know what's going on in the world, and it just seems like it can't be controlled anymore. So it's, um, no, I didn't get any message. <laughs> I just have nightmares of seeing creatures and, and sensations and a piece of mystery metal in my leg and uh, this whole adventure. So, um, but it makes you think about um, everything from creation to what's out there as far as the Hubble telescope can see. Um, you go to observatories and go to museums and just, you look at these photos of the universe and outward. It's like, really, what is the story? Maybe some people know. I mean, when you're flying around in the space station above Earth, who knows what those guys are seeing and they're not saying anything. So there's more to the story. I'm kind of a newbie in this. I'm sure you and Jeremy know a lot more than I do about you know, the history of these UFOs. I've just kind of ponied up a little bit since I've been dealing with this, but. Um, I say there's more chance of this all being a true story than not. Well, I've never had an encounter. I, I've never had an encounter like you've had, and Jeremy hasn't either. But you, I'd like to know, uh, you didn't get any alien editorials, but I'm sure you've formed impressions. You don't have a sense that they're here for our benefit, do you? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh... But that's just my opinion, just because you look at what's happening in the world. Now, maybe uh, with technology, I don't know if it's really better for us, but maybe in the uh, medical profession we're being helped. Um, I mean, who knows? Velcro, microwaves, who knows what's been brought around from, like, the Roswell days. I mean, I believe in what happened to Roswell is true. I mean, all that effort for a weather balloon or something, I mean, let's, let's be serious. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's definitely some truth to all of this. And if my, the object of my leg is part of it, we don't know yet. Jeremy, let me ask you what, what it was about patient 17 that you found to be credible. Why you um, are going out on the limb this far to, to, to share his story. I mean, there are a lot of abductee stories that, you know, you, it, they sound like a, you could drive a truck through them. But this one, something registered with yeah. you. Yeah, you know, it really was because he was a bigger skeptic than any of us. It, it was it was really because, um, you know, the situation, it, you know, was that he wanted answers. And then when Dr. Weir passed away, I mean, I could see it. I mean, we had become friends, and he wasn't getting answers. I mean, I could see it even in the first, you know, when, when Dr. Weir was here. You'll see in the film, he gets frustrated. Patient 17 gets frustrated with Dr. Weir because he's just not getting the answers. And so I just... It was his personality, you know, that he was the biggest skeptic, that he wasn't just trying to sell me a whole line of BS, that, that he wanted to know the truth, too. And, you know, we were doing our darndest to get there, and I guess some things we'll know, some things we won't. You know, that's part of a great mystery, is that, is that you don't get everything spoon-fed to you. And, um, I, I would like to mention, because, you know, we're already in this deep. You know, Patient 17 knows that. I mean, this is out. But tonight... For the coast to coast audience, it's an exclusive thing. Um, the, the, you know, you can see the film. The, the pre, I'm calling it the pre premiere. I reserve the right to add to it if anything changes or new information comes to light. This is a real life investigation, but they can actually get that tonight. I did that for the coast audience exclusively. It's uh, you know, uh, the whole movie. So, well, cool. Um, yeah. And and what do you? How do you like it, Patient Seventeen? 
How well, do you like the movie? <laughs> it's good. I think uh, it's not a major dollar production, something like Fourth of July, but it tells the story. And I like the, the way he put it together. He let me have a, um, a little say in it, the motorcycle riding and bringing some of my personal life into it, some shots like that. But he made it fun and interesting. And we, you know, like he said, we walked down the path together and just trying to find out what the truth is. And um, I give it an A. I mean, it's a great. It's a great <laughs> I mean, it beats, it beats anything on YouTube. If you know, if you could surf that and UFOs. I mean, it's really personal. It's modern. The way it's shot, the way it's edited. I mean, it's a, it's a good piece. I would have never done it if he was a total flake. Not it strikes. I mean, it just, yeah, go ahead. I mean, it was just. It's, and I'm sure you wouldn't be talking to Jeremy if if he didn't know his business. So I mean, it, I feel fortunate to hang out with uh, him and all the experiences I've had up to this point. But we'll see where it goes from here, huh, Jeremy. Well, I uh, I I think that uh, it seems that you're not as concerned as I thought you were about your identity getting out. Some people around you must know, uh, because uh, how many six foot nine abductee motorcycle riding guys are there? Uh, Patient 17, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us, and best of luck to you. I hope we get to meet you in person. All right, take care, gentlemen. All right, and we return uh, with my guest, Jeremy Corbell, switching gears just a bit to talk about Nano Man in our next segment. Stay with us. Beautiful Night from 1997's album Flaming Pie. That's Paul McCartney, a starring ballad. Good song, underrated, not played very often on the radio. And the music video is a lot of fun if you've never seen it. Uh, Ringo Starr collaborates on this. He joins uh, in the, and is, uh, has a pretty funny role in the uh, in the music video. If you've never seen it, check it out sometime. Uh, we will be opening up the phone lines in this segment uh, to see what's on your mind. Questions from my guest, Jeremy Corbell. But before that, we're going to cover the story of the Nano Man. This is a scientist, cutting-edge guy, brilliant mind, who has come across evidence of what he thinks is uh, undeniable evidence of uh, some kind of other intelligence here. And we're going to hear about utility fog right after this on Coast to Coast. Jeremy Corbell, before we uh, segue into Nano Man, one more question about Patient 17. Was that a big deal for him to come on live, and uh, was that a big step for him? Oh, man, you, you have no idea, or actually you might be the one person that does have the idea. I mean, it's the, the Bob Lazar syndrome. Um, you know, it's scary. It, it, it's it's really to, to put yourself out there. I mean, privately, you know, over a beer, you can tell somebody about your deepest experiences or something that's kind of like out there but yeah i mean man he was nervous that that's got to be hard so there was this back and forth and he, you know he didn't want to do it I, he really he did it for me and i i appreciate that i thought it was important because i want the audience to hear this is a real person I mean, when you watch the film i don't want you to think this is just like you know it, it's so powerful you know it's a real person he's a real experiences and it's affected him. So, yeah, it was real hard for him to come on. I'm, I'm grateful he did, and probably that's the last time we're going to get him. You know, the people will uh, lump all the abductees together. Oh, yeah, there's another abductee story. Yeah, I've heard this, blah, 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 and they uh, sort of wipe it off their plate. But then you hear sort of the human side of it. I, yeah. I, I could tell that he was struggling with sharing too much insight into his personal life, but... Uh, the human side of it obviously he's been deeply affected by this phenomena through his whole life yeah and, and he doesn't want to be bothered I and mean, he's a hard-working guy I and mean, he gets up at like 4 a.m so i mean the, he's exhausted right now i mean that was a a big deal too and yeah i mean that it really is that's the experience it's a human experience talking with him and that's the experience i had filming him is when he'd he'd finally forget the camera was there and, and he would talk to me about it i mean you get to see this it's like it's traumatic. I mean, you know, I, I was not into this thing. The, the whole abduction thing was nothing I would ever touch, and I probably never will again. But, but this story needed to happen because we needed results, and Dr. Lear sadly passed away, you know? Um, did, oh, say, segue into our next uh, topic, which is Nano Man. Uh, I, it sounded like he was saying that Nano Man had something to do with your investigation of the object pulled out of his leg. Is that true? 
Well, at one point, I did have him analyze, and he is featured in the film as looking at the analysis. And, you know, from the analysis, you know, itself, I mean, he, he gave his opinion. I didn't really tell him much about it. You know, I asked him, is this a Tonka truck? You know, you're, you're a nanotechnologist. You deal with, you know, extraordinary alloys on the micro scale. You know, could you make this? You know, could you make these 35 elements, you know, play nice together, you know, um, into a metal structure? Uh, and, you know, his answer was no. And, and that was pretty astounding because I have seen some incredible things that Nanoman has done. I have actually witnessed him weave carbon nanotubes with these micro machines that he built that not only heated this carbon, but then also, you know, was able to kind of bring it into spools. And it's the strongest stuff on the planet. This is the stuff that they were, it's the strongest substance that humans have ever made. Um, this is something they were going to do the space you know, tether with, you know, for getting payloads up into space. I mean, it's, it's look it up, uh, you know, graphene. It, it, it's amazing. So I've seen him do incredible things. And when he was so shocked by, by the, the, you know, this analysis, you know, it, it carried some weight. And, and that's what he was referring to. Okay. Well, so tell us who is Nano Man and why can't we know his name? <laughs> You, you will be able to know his name in like a year, but look, if movies are always like, you know, a year or two years behind. Right now, I'm filming so many things with him, and he actually just got some, you know, kind of a big contract. And, you know, he, understandably, I mean, Invisible College, George, you know, he wants to, at this moment, you know, just kind of be left alone. He, he doesn't mind me putting out the utility fog piece, I and mean, he stands firmly behind everything that we've shot and, and his statements, but there will come a time, probably in the next year, where, you know, we'll tell everybody who he is, and it's not a, not a huge mystery, but that'll probably be when I release the work that he's been doing on his space drive, which is, a, you know, an advanced propulsion system. Which is another that. project. That's another project of yours. Yeah, different project. The, the, yes, different project. All right, so, so give me the general parameters, uh, who he is, what his qualifications are, I yeah. mean, you've told me about it in private. Uh, he's a brilliant person, right? He's a he's a brilliant scientist. I mean, you know, I, I I know essentially that you know he he was working at Lawrence Livermore. He's a nanotechnician. He's developed a huge company. Uh, the company did some some great real wor- world commercialization of carbon nanotubes. Um, I mean, legit guy. The n- more will be known about him, but um, yeah, he, he's just one of the most kind of brilliant individuals who really seeks to commercialize technologies where a lot of people are happy with theory and this and that i mean he is in his shop machining metals and you know i was i was up in his attic and we were we were spinning this rotor at like 5000 rpm and i'm like sitting on a box of neodymium magnets with my iphone in my, in my pocket and my camera and he goes get, get off get off of that and um you know this and he thought the thing was going to explode funny the neodymium magnets were from Bob Lazar's business united nuclear he he just figured that out on camera which is funny but um look he, he's a brilliant scientist he, he, he works with his father. He actually got originally a huge grant to do the carbon nanotubes through Wright-Patterson, w- which I found fascinating. They carbon were, nanotubes, what the heck is that? What, what's that? Okay, so uh, that, for me that was a new one too. Uh, essentially, it's highly ordered carbon. So it's, uh, you know, not, I mean nothing, it's just carbon. But, uh, for example, like graphene, they say that the joke is uh, you could stand an elephant on a high heel in high heels on it when it's just like one atom thick and it wouldn't tear or break. It's the strongest substance humans have ever made, and it's essentially like interlocking atomic structures of of, of carbon. And um, so I guess these tubes that that he's created, he weaves them and he brings them together into these strings, and then he weaves the strings into thread and thread into rope. And it is literally the strongest substance on Earth. And uh, that's, he kind of pioneered a lot of this, and, and his funding was uh, military, actually. And he's not a UFO guy. He is not a UFO guy, but, and here's the drum roll, um, a lot of what he knew was possible in nanotechnology when he was going out uh, to school on the East Coast, even his teachers weren't kind of on board with him. With, with, with what he thought was possible and it, with commercialization. 
But he did convey to me a story, oddly enough, and this was not our focus. And that's what's so funny. I got introduced you know, to him through military friends. So it was not our focus. Our focus was his propulsion systems. But he kind of confided in me that how he knew a lot of this was possible is he was shown technology before. And he was shown technology that there was no way it could have been built uh, by, human, you know, by human hands. And to this day, he stands by that, and that's what motivated him. He says, I'm one of the only nanotechnicians on Earth who knows for a fact that the ET reality you know, is real and true, and that's a very motivating thing. That, that's what he told me. And this is utility fog. Okay, well, this utility fog is an interesting thing. So we're there at, at his place, and I'm, I'm, following, I'm kind of documenting the development, the pitfalls, the lows and the highs of his propulsion system. Right, and he starts to talk to me a little bit more about you know what he knows about you know visitors, and he actually pulls out this vial, and it just looked like water, and he, and he says, you know, in here is a little sample that was collected at an abduction site. Uh, he had some from a crop circle, some from a, a household where there was a you know visitation, and it, and he said inside of this like what looked like water to me, it was ethanol, and there was a highly ordered, fabricated nanotechnology that is something that we could not produce here on Earth. We do not have the technology to do this. And I'm just like, come on, dude. You know, I'm trying, not, I'm trying to make a normal film for once, and you're bringing this to me, you know? I, I didn't believe him. So I said, look, how about you, with all of your great connections, how about you get me somewhere like NASA and let me, let me analyze it on a scanning electron microscope? I was kind of like joking. And sure enough, he, I get a call, and he had hooked up the ability for me to get a full filming, no restrictions, no escort at NASA Ames. And he gave me this liquid, which I still didn't believe I'd, I'd be able to replicate what he saw nine years ago in, in this thing. And he just kind of pulled it out from a drawer. So he sent me on this mission, which I thought was going to fall flat on its face, um, to analyze this material at NASA, and they gave me a technician. Let's uh, let's hear a little clip from him, uh, and then we're going to hear more in, in a moment about what these things look like under a microscope. The the first clip from Nano Man talking about uh, skepticism. You, you don't want to come across as crazy yourself. You you are skeptical too, but now I have something. I have something in my hand that cannot be explained in any other way. Where the hell did this come from? This should not be. This should not be for another thousand years. This is so advanced. We wouldn't know where the, the first place to start in making this material, making functional machines on the nanoscale. Robots. So he's talking about the images that you have shared with me before of this utility fog stuff seen under, seen under major uh, magnification, yeah. and they look like little tiny microscopic robots. I mean, okay, so that, that's, that's what he's seeing, you know, and, and, I, and I do see, it's, it, you know, it's like I do see what he's seeing, but I'm, I'm not a scientist. And then he's explaining the magnification, and it's getting kind of more impressive the more he says it, but it's, it's just an image, but yes. You know, it gives me shivers, actually, to, to hear that uh, quote. And, and the reason why it gives me shivers is because I fully expected to go to NASA on a fool's errand and have the tech lab guy, who's not a UFO guy, he's just a NASA tech guy, you know, and I, I expected him to, to say, w w this is nothing. There, there's nothing in here. It's ethanol. Go home. And what happened? Um, that's it, the exact opposite is what happened. Actually, what, what happens is really funny, um, and, and you go through this, this ride in the film. It's like what, what happens is I, I get there, you know, he's looking. We can't see, uh, you know, the, we have these comparative images. We, we can't see it. You know, we see these little clusters of things. So we call Nano Man on the phone, and we're like, and well, the lab technician, you know, says, hey, um, we're seeing clusters of things, but we're, we're not seeing or being able to image what you saw nine years ago. At least there's something in it, but, but we can't see it. And he goes, oh, golly, that's amazing. He's like, all you have to do is change your beam parameters. 
You need to intensify the beam and you'll penetrate the outer skin and you'll see the inner workings. And we're like, what? You know, the guy's kind of laughing. You know, he's a young guy like me and he's kind of laughing and then, okay, changes the beam parameters and he just like grabs his face. I mean, again, you go through this experience, he grabs his face and, and he's like, well, I can't explain what I'm seeing right now. And what it came down to was we were able to penetrate through the outer shell or skin of these clusters, and inside we were able to image and replicate exactly these clusters of what look like, um, you know, just highly ordered mechanisms. Now, now I, I'm not convinced. This is an investigation. This is an open investigation. But first step, we were able to replicate what he said would be in there, what has inspired so much of his real-world work, right? So if nothing else, knowing that this exists has inspired him to move forward. You know, he wants to become, you know, he wants to build a spaceship. You know, he wants to build an engine. So basically at the end, the, the nanotech um, or the, 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 the scope technician, you know, he says, look, in a thousand years, we'll be able to make something like this. We'll, we'll be able to print things on the atomic level. We'll be able to make holes and voids that are like less than a you know half nanometer. He says, but right now we don't have the technology to do this. We will one day, but uh, not now. Let's let's hear him describe what he says these things are. Uh, it's in clip two. Okay. Imagine millions upon millions of machines microscopic machines, all working together in unison. These machines are so small that we are just now bringing online the capability to see them, much less make them. I guess the significance of that quote is that this guy is a top-notch person in his field. He is cutting edge, a brilliant researcher, as evidenced by the kinds of contracts, the size of the contracts that he gets from a variety of really interesting agencies to do yeah. work on on cutting edge technology, and here he is saying the utility fog shows these microscopic machines. There's no question about it, and we don't have the technology to make it. Yeah, we just have the technology now to barely see it. You know, with these scanning electron microscopes. You know, but but actually, he's not just a researcher. You know, he is a commercialization expert. I mean, this is what he did. This was his grant from the government, and they were originally interested in his, uh, what he calls the space drive, um, but he got into the carbon nanotubes because it was something that he knew he could do that couldn't be weaponized, that there was a grant for, and, you know, he built a great company out of it. So he's an expert in commercialization. So, you know, the significance, the significance of this quote is that, you know, he's essentially saying, you know, we don't have the technology uh, to make this. So if it is what he thinks it is, right, he's calling it utility fog. Well, that, that's a science fiction term. That, that's the idea of a bunch of machines working in unison together towards a single cause through an intelligence or a supercomputer. Now, there is a reason why he believes that this, I guess, alloy, this dusted alloy that are found at, you know, crop circles and found at abduction sites, you know, which we know with trace cases that there, there is residue left over. He believes for a reason that this is what he calls utility fog. And I, I really think maybe he should tell us that. So I'd love to see if I can get him on at some point soon and he could tell us his, his own personal experience and why he's really sure these are activating machines. I, you know, I've got some people on the phones. I don't want to uh, go to a phone call and not have enough time. We're going to yeah. go to a break in about two minutes. But uh, did he describe to you how he acquired this utility fog sample? Y- yes, you know, he did. He has a couple different samples. And, again, one was, you know, he went and researched the crop circles a little bit because he thought it was a joke and then had an experience. And then, you know, he knows people that send him stuff. I mean, he's one of these top-notch scientists visible college you know he's willing to use his assets to to look at things and he's the first to debunk things so this really got him this really got him deeply when when he couldn't figure this one out and you know right now i just had a phone conversation with him, you know this this evening you know he's under nda not to talk about it but the basics of it is you know he's been working also on cold fusion which is a huge taboo right well he's got 11 employees now full-time 
and they're working towards commercialization of, of their project, and he says it's going really well. And uh, this is kind of his focus right now. So, look, he's a fascinating dude. I would love to have him uh, come on and tell you his experience, why he's sure these are self-actuating machines. <laughs> okay, well, let's have it. When? Let's schedule it. I, I don't know. we gotta, <laughs> we, we've um, got to reel him in. I mean, cold fusion, if the, that breakthrough is made... And, and many have tried, it changes everything. Well, we know cold fusion is actually, like, we know it happens in nature, but it's just, can we harness it, right? And, um, yeah, it would be absolutely huge. And, you know, look, a year ago, I mean, I kind of confided in you that he was having positive results, and I went and did a lot of filming with him. Well, now we're a year later, and he's got enough to have 11 employees working full-time on this. So... You know, all I got to say is this guy's one of the most interesting men I have ever met in my life. You know, well, that <laughs> makes it sound like there's him. a breakthrough. Is there a breakthrough? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll let him discuss that uh, if he can <laughs> next time he's on, if we can get him on. But um, yeah, he says everything is going really, really well. I mean, all right, all right, we're going to take a break. I promise we'll go to the phones uh, after we come back. It's summertime. You got to have a Beach Boy song. This is a classic from 1964, co-written by Brian Wilson. Don't worry, baby. We'll be right back with more Coast to Coast. Parrot Heads, that one's for you. Jimmy Buffett, Havana Day Dreamin' from 1976. That's uh, back when Jimmy Buffett was sort of fine-tuning his persona as uh, a beach bum troubadour slash pirate. That uh, that song, that uh, whole imagery makes me want to just jump on a plane and go somewhere tropical. We're talking with Jeremy Corbell about his variety of his projects, uh, including the Nano Man. When we come back, we jump on the phone line, see what's on your mind. Much more to come here in our final segment of Coast to Coast AM. All right, let's take some calls from my guest, Jeremy Corbell. Let's go west west of the Rockies, John in San Diego. Hi, John. You're on with Jeremy Corbell. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking my call. I just had a couple of quick comments and, uh, and a quick question for Jeremy, if I could. Uh, actually, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you, George, real briefly at the uh, International UFO Congress back in February, where I also had the pleasure of, uh, of meeting Jeremy. And uh, ever since then, I've been kind of following his work and uh, following, following his stuff through his website. Um, since then, I just wanted to put out to the, to the Coast audience that, uh, you know, as, as a younger guy and somebody who's, who's in the military, I don't really have too many outlets or options for expressing my interest in the topic, but, but boy, Jeremy's work really really satisfied my curiosity kind of kind of hits the spot so to speak um and so i would just encourage everyone who's listening tonight or, or listening on a on a future podcast or whatnot to to really check out his stuff through his website and, and support his work um so with that being said I, I guess my question for you jeremy is um besides utility fog and uh the piece on bob that you have available on your website and patient 17 which was released tonight which was an awesome movie, by the way. I got a chance to see that at a screening at the Congress in, uh, in February. Um, what can we expect next, and when can we expect it? Because uh, I know there's a, there's a core group of people that can't get enough, uh, myself included. Well, John, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your support, and thank you for calling in. I really appreciate it. And, uh, man, you really pushed me against the wall here with a question. Isn't three movies <laughs> you know, enough right now? Man, I'm working hard. But uh, I have a lot of things you know, kind of in the oven right now. And things are done at the right time when they're ready. If you look at my website, you can really sample a lot of the pieces. There's a lot of like Easter eggs and kind of hidden things in there for you to see. So, um, you know, look, as being a fan, you'll be one of the first people to know, John. Uh, but I would say that my work will follow in this vein. It's real investigative uh, filmmaking. I, I, I actually do this by myself and, and go as far as I can go with it. So that I can promise you. As far as uh, the future projects, you're just going to have to wait and see, man. But thank you so much for your support. Thanks, John. East of the Rockies, Ira in Oklahoma City. Hi, Ira. You're on Coast to Coast. Well, hi. How you doing? I just wanted to uh, make a comment and say um, thank you, George and Jeremy, for the work that you do and bring up the issues that you bring up and you brought up. Um, I've been in the UFOs and following this stuff, um, distant papers, um, Hill Schneider, you know, Benowitz, and Montauk, and uh, Belts and all that stuff for years. Um, I read the book, um, The Case for UFO, back when I was a kid, and I was hooked after that. I just, I just want to make a comment, you know, as far as um, Bob Lazar goes, you know. If people out there are thinking that the United States government can't 
get rid of somebody's identity or school records or anything like that. But they're either awful naive or really egotistical, because that can be done pretty easily, I would think. Um, anyway, I just really enjoy your show. It's, um, it you know makes people open their eyes, I think. Well, thanks, Ira. Appreciate it. I, I would mention to you this experience. Bob Lazar got into some legal trouble at some point, and uh, when he got into legal trouble, uh, he was asked by investigators about his background, and he told them the same story he had told me. Uh, this was a time uh, the, the investigators could not confirm his background because he had told them the same story. I mean, they had uh, gone to all kinds of uh, uh, different agencies and asked for information and couldn't get it. We had a congressman named Jim B- Jim Bilbray who did the same thing, and he uh, wrote a letter for the judge who was sentencing Bob for the things he had done. And the congressman said, basically, I've never seen anything like it. We wrote to the FBI to ask for any files they might have on Bob Lazar, and we weren't told they don't have any. We were told, you don't have a right to know. This is a member of U.S. Congress. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Well, you know, just that that was one of the most astounding things. When you, when you really look at the facts and you look at all the facts in the Lazar case, it is a resounding answer. You know, we need to start considering if what Bob Lazar has told us is absolutely true. Uh, we're going to go to uh, my, Mike in Washington State on the wild card line. Hi, Mike. You're on with Jeremy Corbell. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, George. Uh, I've been a listener since 1989. I've been following the story for a long time. I even emailed you tonight, George, about this and your producer. And I would really like to see a coast-to-coast debate between uh, you, Jeremy, and uh, Stan T. Friedman. I'm inclined to believe the Lazar story, but I have some reservations about it because of the Stan Friedman data and and research that he's done. Um, And, Jeremy, I don't know you, and you seem like a pretty cool guy, actually. I've heard you a few times on the show. Um, But I'm going to say something here. You know, I get the MUFON journal, and I read an article that you posted recently. In your article, you wrote, ufology owes a debt of gratitude to Mr. Friedman. His decades of work have earned our respect, but his long tenure does not give him the right to pull the same kind of closed-minded, dirty tricks as the noisy negativists he has so often criticized. Dirty tricks, Jeremy? I mean, I I think that's a little harsh. I mean, even later on in the article, you go on to say that Bob's claims have been exceedingly difficult to validate. Now, I am inclined to believe the Lazar story, but, you know, to put down Stanton in the kind of way that you did in the article, I don't, I don't think it's warranted. I don't, I don't think that that was fair to Stan. And, um, you know, I mean, I just... Uh, well, I let, me, let me let me just and, remind and I, you. And I think, I think, one last thing, I think, uh, you know... Stanton will probably investigate this Dr. Krangle, who's all of a sudden uh, coming out of the woodwork here. And, and one last thing, Jeremy, uh, when I try to get on your website, it's always down. So is there a problem with the website? And uh, thanks a lot, George, for your, your work over the years. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the comments, and I think they're very fair. And uh, uh, Jeremy can answer, and then I'm going to add something to, as well. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate your, your comments and your input. And, you know, you must be going to the wrong website because everybody's hitting it and it's up. So, you know, keep, keep trying, I guess. But, um, no, I, I really appreciate your perspective. But I think it's unfair to, to not look at what that article was in response to. Um, you know, what happened was, and I'm not picking on Stan. Like, I, I like Stan. You know, as you said, George, you know, he's contributed so much to the field. The, I got put in this uncomfortable position. It's, I'm not debating him. It's not me versus him. You know, but I did have the experience where in the debate that they kind of threw me into, that, that, that I was talking to somebody who was not willing to process current information. It was like an auto-repeat, and, you know, a reboot is needed in ufology. So to the specific point of what I said and is written in that article, I, I'd have to say I was responding directly to the MUFON article from the month, two months prior, where Stan wrote some things about the evidence that I put forward that were straight-out lies. They were inaccurate, and they were untrue. And anybody that watches the video of how I conducted myself on stage, the evidence I provided, and my opinions, these were not them, what he wrote. So I had to um, you know, kind of put my two cents in there. Look, I'm going to call it as I see it. You know? And that was some spin doctor stuff. That is not what I said. That is not how the argument went down. 
And just because you repeat something over and over doesn't make it true. So basically, I invite people to question and to debate, and I invite people to continue talking about it. And I'm not picking on anybody, but I am going to defend myself when, I, you know, when something is said about me or something is said that I said that I didn't. So I, I suggest you read both articles, compare them, and then watch the interview that was recorded. That will tell all. Bottom line is, I'm not important, and a debate with, with Sand is not important to me. What's important is, what can we learn now about the Lazar case? How can we move this forward? And we need to be open to change. We need to be open to new information. I would just add to this, Mike, that uh, I have uh, ult- utmost respect uh, for Stan and all the work that he has done. And I have respect for him, uh, the fact that he has uh, taken the trouble to look into the Lazar story, because a lot of people have passed judgment on it without doing any work on their own. But I would tell you this, is that Stan says there's no evidence of degrees. Uh, the evidence that he worked at Los Alamos is is uh, scant. And those were inf- that's information that we presented in the very first television report about Bob Lazar. It's not something that Stan Friedman dug up. Um, I reported it on television. It went all over the world in the very first story that ever discussed uh, Bob Lazar. So it's not an expose. It wasn't a gotcha. That was part of the story from the beginning. Uh, I'm glad that Stan repeated the steps that I had taken and dug this stuff up, but it was no secret. So thanks for the information, and I suppose we're going to have to have Stan on at some point. Uh, John in Long Beach, you're on with Jeremy Corbell. How you doing? Hello, John. Hello. Howdy. Hello. What's on your mind? Um, yeah, I, uh, I dropped my phone there. <laughs> I wanted to, by the way, George, uh, to paraphrase Jimmy Buffett, I want to uh, go to the topical here uh, a little bit. <laughs> you know, you said tropical. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I wanted to um, ask you, you know, now that you, when you can conceive of something like the little, like the, the tiny machines, uh, let's say that it, the guy's just imagining that and, and he, he thinks he sees it. But once you, you know, you said it may take make decades or something. But, it, you know, we have allegedly experienced, um, you know, they found some things, you know, if I don't know if it's true or not, but they found some uh, machinery and things and crash sites that uh, we engineered quickly, uh, allegedly, uh, to, you know, perform and, 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 and do well uh, within our, you know, within our ability to do it. So if they, can con- if they think they can conceive this now, I think it, it is not that much of a leap to think within... 20 years or something that we could actually make it into something because when you have to conceive of something first in order to in order to you know to uh, to make it work and so I, i'm just saying that if they actually can do that within the uh you know the, the technology that we have maybe not making the machines but find some other way to do similar functions uh you know we can already, already build a house out of a printer kind of thing yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean once we have that information that that concept at our at our at our disposal that that's where the, the theories lead to the practice. Well, it'd be nice to know uh, what goes on behind closed doors, behind the veil of secrecy. Uh, I can't even imagine what kind of technology they've got that we uh, don't know about yet. Uh, we do yeah. get glimpses occasionally from uh, the kind of work that Jeremy is doing with Nanoman, for example. Uh, uh, yeah. Jeremy, you want to jump into that? Yeah, just that, you know, I, I absolutely agree with, you know, the caller, which is that, you know, your I- imagination, you know, once it's ignited, that's, that's the beginning of everything. You know, everything needs to be conceived of in thought, and then it comes into action. So, you know, I, I agree with you. And exploring these realms of the unknown, I really feel like my life is a twilight zone. I mean, it's like every time I try to make a normal movie or have a normal day, Something extraordinary happens, and, and, and I love it. And so, you know, it's, it's wild to pursue these questions. And, and, as, uh, and I'll quote a friend of mine, big questions, you know, <laughs> maybe disturbing answers. I mean, I, you know, this is a, an exciting field. And now that I've started, I don't think I can stop. I'm going to keep making movies and kind of shining the light and the camera's my passport to, to the unknown. Appreciate the call. East of the Rockies, Dan in Pennsylvania. Good morning, Dan. You're on with Jeremy Corbell. Hi, George. Hi, Jeremy. Jeremy, I met you before. My name is Dan Banker. We talked uh, one night on Facebook, probably for about six hours about Lazar. Um, I just want to bring a couple of points up. I'll accept the Stanton Friedman challenge, and I will go on record and challenge anybody with a Lazar case uh, proving against Lazar 
One point I'd like to bring up tonight, everybody's bringing up that Bob Lazar worked at Los Alamos. Not many uh, declined that he did work there, but my question would be, why would he quit? If he was a physicist from MIT and you get a dream job at Los Alamos, why did he quit to be a photo processor, processor in Las Vegas? Uh, that would be my first point if you guys would want to try and uh, grab an answer at that because that's a dream job. I, why would you yeah, quit? Well, I mean, let's just, you know, let's start with that. I mean, what I think, George, we, we often uh, forget is that there's a human component to all choices. And, you know, it can look illogical from the outside to any of us. Uh, you know, when when we make choices, but I mean, I know better than anybody that you know, lady troubles can make you make you change occupation pretty darn quick. So I don't know how much I want to say about that, but that's not the biggest mystery when it when it comes to the L- Lazar. You know, let's all keep our eye on the prize here. Did Bob Lazar work at Los Alamos? And you know, I think we've proven that you know over and over for the last twenty five years. Well, I, I, I don't disagree, but he was there through Kirk Mayer. Uh, it was more like a. a but everybody, everybody's respectfully, respectfully, everybody's you know most people are subcontractors out there. I mean, so it really does. That's again, that's a mirage man you know thing that people say. Oh, he worked at Kirk Mayer. You know, it's like. Through through her, so what? You know, he was a he was a right. you know he was I, yeah. Actor. Uh, Dan, I would point out that the Kirkmeyer stuff was also in the very first story. We we reported that uh, Bob had been recruited and hired through Kirkmeyer. We also reported that Kirkmeyer uh, had told me when I first contacted them that they had personnel files on Bob. Uh, they said I could have them. I got uh, signed permission from him to acquire them. And then they said no. And we went back and forth for almost three years. And the files that they had agreed to give me in the beginning, they said no longer existed. And then they stopped taking my call. So Kirkmeyer is not some, also not a revelation that uh, somebody else dug up. That was in the very first story about Bob. Yeah, yeah, look, Bob Lazar told people the time and the place to go see a saucer lift up out of Papoose Lake. And Gene Huff, who was on the line, was one of those people that saw it. They ducked behind a car because it looked like it was going to explode. I mean, it's just every piece adds up to the conclusion that Lazar is not lying. And, and that's hard to swallow. You know, yeah, if, your take with... if, if your take on this is, uh, okay, Bob worked at Los Alamos, but why did he quit? Really? Is that is that really zeroing in on the central part of the story? Um, because there are uh, explanations for that. I think Bob probably doesn't want to open up all the parts of his personal life, um, but I, I suppose people expect it. Trat and I just wrote it gets in far more detail. One more thing I want to add is on the edu- educational credentials. In 1993 at the Little Alien, Bob Lazar could not uh, identify any of his professors that he had an MIT, could not could not even uh, verify the year he graduated. He had to sit there and think about it. And the one professor he did come up with was a Dr. Dutzler who taught at Pierce Junior College. That's true. Why well, I'm, you know, going to I'm, I'm gonna, just going to stop you, Dan. I'm going to stop you right here. Um, we got about two minutes left in the program. This is all pretty much um, well-documented and reported many, many times. Uh, Bob, if you know him, uh, can't remember what he had for breakfast yesterday. He doesn't know who played in the Super Bowl. He doesn't know what uh, what's playing on television. Uh, he can. He's a really smart guy, but he doesn't have uh, the kind of connection you do to uh, normal stuff. And uh, the fact that he can't remember uh, professors and stuff like that is not a surprise. It's also, um, you know, if you believe, as I do, that he probably did not, uh, that he exaggerated his educational credentials, so what? Uh, is that does that throw out the entire story? It's something that we've uh, discussed in public presentations. It's not something we can cover in just a minute or so. You seem to have, be pretty emotionally involved with it, and I'm not quite sure why that is. But uh, I can tell you that there there's a there's a lot more to it than can be examined in a couple of minutes. Nothing that you've brought up in uh, in your very passionate um, discourse. Has is new. I mean, it's all stuff that's been gone over a whole bunch of times. Jeremy, I don't know right, if you want to jump in or not. Yeah, and and it's just you know, and but I understand it. You know, from the outside sure. looking in, all these things they just keep coming up and coming up. But bottom line is, if Bob you know shows his MIT certificate, let's say he did go there, is that going to prove UFOs? No. And then Bob could have been homeschooled, as I keep saying, and still worked at Los Alamos and got invited to do this job. I mean. 
you know, he, he passed polygraph tests. I mean, you know, look, argue it all day in circles. I, I, I'm done. My logic is, is simply I cannot prove his, his, his schooling. I'm, I'm over that. I want to know about him and Los Alamos in the 80s. Check. Now it's feasible to me. Now that we have that on the record... And it's not the only person, but it's the one on the record. Now it's feasible to me that he was picked up to work out there. And, you know, of course, I have other private confirmations in my way, but All know, right. look, fascinating. Yeah, it, it's uh, fun. It, it, uh, people have staked out their positions. They can believe what they want. We know that Bob doesn't really care what, what yeah. they believe either way. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We'll have you back again. Some great stuff you're doing. Thanks to earlier guest John Lear, Gene Huff, Jim Goodall. Patient 17, the Nano Man, and Dr. Robert Krangle, and of course to Jeremy Corbell. Good night, everyone.